Hello to all of you from uh, wherever you are watching us uh, today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the IRF annual conference, uh, Innovation Charting Pathways to a Sustainable Mobility, being brought to you uh, this year in a full digital format. My name is Susanna Zamataro. I'm the Director General of the International Road uh, Federation, and it's my honor to be your master of ceremony today. I'll uh, quickly run you through the agenda with the assistance of um, Agostina. I, I hope uh, it's, uh, it's on the screen. Yes, there I, I see it. Um, we will be um, keeping you busy for the next two mornings. Um, we will start immediately um, soon after this with an opening uh, session. Then uh, we will be hosting session one on investing in uh, road safety. That will be followed by a 30 minute sessions where you will be hearing from our uh, members, uh, very short uh, presentations of five minutes on um, a couple of um, innovation updates. Session two will be tackling um, digitalization in our sector. That session will last uh, roughly one hour 30 and then we'll close for uh, today at around 12.30 uh, Geneva time. Tomorrow we'll be starting uh, uh, a little bit earlier at 9.25 with a quick uh, recap of five minutes uh, just to uh, bring on board those who were uh, going to reach us uh, only a, as a second day. We will be looking um, in session three uh, on how to embed sustainability into infrastructure projects. Uh, we will have a very interesting session um, a hearing from um, from the startup label IRF startup label finalist uh, and their pitching sessions. Um, so make sure you don't miss that. And last but not least, in session four, we will be taking a, a general look into uh, what are the current trends into road uh, transport. And last but not least, make sure you stick with us till the very last moment uh, tomorrow because we'll have a special announcement uh, for uh, you. Now, um, I think I uh, ought to give you a couple of um, logistics also for the uh, audience who's uh, watching, us, uh, watching us today. I please ask all the other speakers to have their microphone uh, closed um, until they're called to the, um, to the stage. Um, as you have seen, we will have no breaks in between sessions, so we kindly request all speakers really to stick within the allocated time and be ready with their slides and camera and video when the session is about to start. For the audience, all of you who are joining us literally from all over the world today, uh, you have been muted by default. This is a typical webinar setting, so it means that you cannot open up your microphone or put your camera on but you can use the chat function that you normally should be seeing at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom navigation bar. Now use the chat function to, to exchange, uh, to make comments, to exchange with other colleagues connecting today. But if you want to ask specific questions, uh, use the question and answer button that you also see in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom. And if you want to address specifically your question to a, a speaker, please say so uh, right at the beginning, question four and the name of uh, the speaker. We kindly ask you also to uh, have short questions because time is limited and we want to make sure that we provide enough space to uh, everyone. Uh, another important information is simultaneous translation today, uh, Chinese, English, Chinese. Uh, again, look at your uh, Zoom navigation bar. You will see an interpretation button in there. Click in there and select the English channel. If you want to listen to the conference in English, select Chinese, of course, if you want to have the conference in uh, Chinese. Know as well that this event is being uh, recorded and we'll be sharing the recording uh, with all of you, including all the slides that are being presented uh, today. You'll be notified automatically when the conference proceedings are available and you will find them on, a, on the dedicated event page that we have built on our website, www.irfnet.ch. Now, without further delay, let me transit you immediately into the opening uh, session just to make sure we stick within our time and welcome uh, to the stage uh, Mr. Bill Alkes, um, the president of the International Road uh, Federation, uh, for his welcoming uh, remarks. Uh, please, Bill, have your uh, video on. I can see you and your microphone uh, open and the floor is yours. 
Dear colleagues, distinguished speakers, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Athens, Greece. I'm very pleased to welcome you all on behalf of the International Road Federation to our annual conference, being hosted in a digital format this year and made freely accessible to all of you, thanks to the support of our members and also thanks to the support of our sponsors for this event, our gold sponsors, 3M and Halastron, the Greek Association of Toll Road Network, our silver sponsor, Together for Safe Roads, our special sponsor and member, China Highway and Transportation Society, who is making simultaneous translation available for the entire duration of the event today and tomorrow. I want to take a moment to acknowledge as well some of our partners who are here with us, TRB, ASECAP, Ertico, Brita, Sustainable Mobility for All, ERF, SLOCAD, and FIA, and to thank them for the excellent collaboration we keep building throughout the years. We have an impressive lineup of speakers for the next two days, and I want to express my gratitude to all of them for having responded positively to this invitation. My thanks also to all of you watching or listening to us today. I must say the response has been overwhelming this year, and we have attendance literally from all over the world. We are very pleased to know that you find value in our work and that we are being able to fulfill IRF's core mission. That is, one, facilitate the exchange of knowledge and expertise, two, foster partnerships and collaboration, and three, work in collaboration with others to save policy and to advocate for a sustainable mobility. Partnerships are really the DNA of IRF and in line with our mission, we are doing our utmost to facilitate collaboration and coordination on all fronts. IRF is a membership-based organization based in Geneva, where Susanna and her people are, but operating globally and representing leading corporate and institutional players drawn from the road and mobility sectors worldwide and that since 1948. As all of you know, the United Nations Sustainable Transfer Conference which was hosted last week in Beijing, China, has put forward a new plan for the UN Decade of Action for Road Safety, which will be officially launched at the end of this month. We also have the COP26 starting early next month. So I will say there could not be a better moment for us to come together as a community to talk about innovation and sustainability. For the road sector, this means finding innovative ways to fulfill the need of building new roads, maintaining, upgrading, and operating the existing road network while aligning these actions with the provisions of the Paris Agreement and those of the Sustainable Development Goals, looking for an equitable, safe, and sustainable mobility for all. Our collective task, create a truly safe, sustainable, and efficient multimodal transportation system. For this to happen, we need to think and start doing things differently. The arrival of new digital technologies is enabling efficiency improvements in existing transport systems, as well as making them more user-friendly and sustainable. The ability to make real-time data and information available to operators and users of our road systems is what will facilitate integration across transport networks and modes going forward. Finally, more than the extraordinary mobility changes, we are witnessing what will be possible without the proper infrastructure. Yet, transforming mobility requires more than just technology and infrastructure. Transforming mobility requires innovation on all fronts, in the way we think, the way we plan, the way we design, and the way we deliver and manage transport systems. And that is exactly what we'll be discussing over the next two days. I look forward to our exchanges. In closing, an invitation to all of you to join the IRF family by becoming a member if you want to drive this important agenda forward with us. Together we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for the passion you always uh, put in, uh, in all your welcoming uh, remarks. Uh, indeed, this opening session is, uh, is also the opportunity for us to share the floor with some of our key uh, partners. 
And um, moving forward, thank you, Bill. Um, I'd, I'd like to welcome to the stage now Massimo uh, Skintu. He's the president of ASECAP, the association, uh, the European Association of Tollway Operators. Massimo, if you can uh, switch on your uh, video and your microphone and come to the stage, uh, please. Uh, I, hope, I hope the audio is okay. Yes, we can hear you and see perfect, you well. Perfect, perfect. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad and honored today, uh, though still virtually, unfortunately, to convey to you and the, um, the greetings uh, and the wishes, the best wishes of all the ASICAP members for a successful annual meeting. ASICAP treasures a lot uh, its cooperation with IRF, and I am very pleased today to recall that our two associations have signed more than two years ago in Brussels, a memorandum of understanding and the cooperation aimed at further strengthening the collaboration between ASEGAP and IRF and among their respective members. As IRF President Vilalkia said in, on that occasion, ASEGAP and IRF started to cooperate uh, in the road safety field, but they can expand their collaboration to several other issues such as infrastructure financing, intelligent transport systems, traffic and infrastructure management and mobility issues. And today we are indeed here to discuss together the path towards a sustainable mobility. We have global common challenges. Uh, climate policy has become one of the highest priority in Europe. The European Green Deal reaffirms the Commission's ambition to make uh, Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. I would like to quote the President of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, becoming the first climate neutral continent by 2050 requires a significant investment from both the public and the private sector. Public finance needs to lead the way private actors and needs to provide the scale. Achieving a, a climate neutral continent uh, will require a, the full mobilization, mobilization sorry, of industry stakeholders uh, in this framework. Uh, the toll motorway sector has been uh, reaffirming uh, its commitment uh, to prepare next generation mobility fulfilling the climate change challenges to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 90% in the transport by 2050, by fostering the, de the deployment of green, safe and innovative transport, including multimodal and autonomous transport, as well as the deployment of alternative fuels infrastructure as a members have reaffirmed their willingness to support the ambitious goals of the European Commission to reach carbon-free objectives for a sustainable road infrastructure. Pandemic is a, a pandemic has shown the importance of sustainable mobility and efficient road infrastructure. The European motorway network represents the backbone of efficient movement of goods and people around Europe. The road operators have shown the, the resilience of roads in providing continuity of services, mainly the delivery of goods for medical care to provide two foods for the citizens. In this context, there is need to remember that therefore, before the pandemic, the road operators were already using efficient instruments to generate activity and employment. They invested 7 billion a year, generating more than 5 billion in tax revenues and employed over 50,000 people. Toll motorway companies are willing to continue investing for decarbonated and connected mobility, optimizing the existing infrastructure by, <clears throat> sorry, by deploying managed lanes, intermodal hubs for mass public transport. Dear delegates, 
I would also like to share with you that as ASCA president, I was strongly supporting what I called my flagship initiative for 2021, which is the redaction of an association sustainability report. And my collaborator, Emanuela Stocchi, will present this initiative to you tomorrow. As ASCAP, we have published our vision of sustainability a few years ago. We will now show our progress with concrete KPIs for first time at ASECAP level. Indeed, the EU institution have adopted the sustainable, sustainable, sustainable and smart mobility strategy, a political and legislative package aimed at developing a comprehensive strategy to ensure that the EU transport sector will be able to contribute to realize a clean digital and modern economy. Well, in our House Cup Sustainability Report, uh, under preparation, we will exactly underline that our sector is ready to answer to the EU sustainability requirements and objectives. Our concessionary companies will, uh, with their experience and now uh, know how, acquired over decades, uh, uh, can play a fundamental role for EU's growth competitiveness and modernization and can address the increasing demand for sustainable mobility. By triggering many positive uh, repercussion, repercussions that reach uh, far beyond the mere financial and operating aspects of motorway concessionaries business. They are also very much uh, committed to build resilient transport systems uh, to the generation to come, but also to answer present daily in uh, mobility trends. Uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, the existing infrastructure will require to be upgraded, adapted and digitalized, which means investments. The use of public-private investment based on user polluter day pay, sorry, principle with foster and development of an efficient road infrastructure with high mobility services, contributing to improve citizens' life. I would like to recall that there are no free roads. In conclusion, I wish to thank you. Uh, all once, all, you all once again for your attention, and I wish you successful IRF uh, annual meeting. Hoping we will have the opportunity to meet again in person very soon. All my best. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, for this intervention. Lots of points, lots of. Um... Uh, lots of points also on the role of private sector and we'll have a chance to come back to that to our, uh, throughout the sessions in the next uh, two days. Um, running already a little bit late, I'd like to uh, now welcome to the stage um, for a pre-recorded intervention because in the US it's still uh, night, Neil Perdison, who is the uh, executive director of the Transportation Research Board, TRB, uh, one of our key partners. Good morning and greetings from the Transportation Research Board in the United States. It is an honor and privilege for me to participate in the opening session of the IRF Annual Conference. TRB is pleased to be a partner with IRF Geneva in addressing the most critical transportation issues. For those of you who are not familiar with TRB, we're the largest transportation research organization in the world, and we bring together researchers and practitioners to address current and future transportation related issues in all modes of transportation. Your theme, innovation, charting pathways to sustainable mobility reflects so much of what we at TRB are currently focused on in our programs and activities. In 2019, TRB issued a report called Critical Issues in Transportation, which identified what it expected to be the most important issues in transportation over the next 10 to 20 years. This report serves to guide the work of TRB's committees and programs. The last edition from 2019 identified 12 critical topics as shown 
in the slide, along with a total of 63 specific issues. The world has changed so much since the last edition of Critical Issues in Transportation was issued. Earlier this year, the TRB Executive Committee issued two addenda on the topics of the impact of COVID-19 on transportation and on racial and social equity issues. TRB also decided that given the rate of change that is taking place in transportation, it would start work on a new edition now. In recognition of the fact that transportation's role is to serve broader societal goals and that it does not exist for its own sake, the new edition will focus on transportation's role in advancing goals of safety and security, economic vitality, climate change and sustainability, public health, and equity. As we collectively look at innovation and advances in technology, it is important that we always keep in mind and address how these innovations and technologies can most effectively be used to address these broader societal goals. I hope that you will keep that in mind as you engage in your discussions during the next two days. We at TRB are committed to continue to engage with IRF Geneva and its members in addressing these issues. We have so much that we can learn from each other. I invite you to join us at TRB as we discuss and do research on many of these issues. I would like to invite each of you to explore our website at www.trb.org become a friend of one or more of our standing technical committees. And I would like to invite each of you to the TRB annual meeting, which will be held in Washington, DC, January 9th to the 13th, 2022. The last time that we held the meeting in person, we had 14,000 attendees. I hope that you all have an informative and engaging IRF annual conference. And I hope that I will be able to see many of you in person in the future. And indeed, we'll, we all look forward to uh, meet again physically in uh, Washington, D.C. for the TRB annual uh, meeting. If Agostina maybe can stop sharing the screen, I'd like now to welcome to the stage our next uh, speaker, uh, Angelos Amditis. Um, Angelos, please uh, put your video on and open up your microphone. Angelos is the president of Ertico, just coming back from a very successful Congress in Hamburg. Indeed, and uh, good morning from uh, Greece, where I am uh, today, right now, and hello to everyone from all over the world. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, IRF, for this uh, kind invitation. I'm quite happy to be here uh, with you today. And um, uh, I'm also very happy to present on behalf of Ertico to welcome and to uh, support this opening session. Uh, I'm also quite thrilled that uh, your conference is taking place just a few days after the ITS Congress held in Hamburg. Uh, we tried to, we did it at a physical event and uh, around 15,000 people were there, which shows exactly the need for uh, all of us to be together again and uh, to meet physically. And I hope the next IRF Congress will also be physically so we can meet each other. So uh, Ertico during that ITS Congress has extended uh, an invitation to uh, mobility organizations active at the European level, and in this case of IRF at the global level, to meet and discuss how to best align on their pathways towards, um, uh, towards a smart uh, mobility and a smart society at the end of the day. In the discussion we held with uh, IRF, uh, CENT, UATP, and ASECA, between others, we all agreed that uh, what makes a society smart is how to progress towards digitalization and how much it values sustainability in its uh, progress of integrating all modes, systems, and technologies into creating a mobility ecosystem. Ertico is uh, planning the creation of a permanent forum where organizations, associations, platforms will have the chance to discuss in a continuous base and formulate common positions and activities. We will be very happy if IRF uh, be part of this uh, forum and uh, we hope that early next year we'll be able to send you an official invitation together with the other associations for that. Ertico is also very happy to know that uh, IRF is also 
and also the other organizations we discussed with is very interested in uh, working with, uh, with us and all the others, because at the end of the day, no one can do that alone in decarbonizing tomorrow's uh, mobility and ensuring society is given its best chance to invest in becoming smart and enjoy its benefits as a whole for the new mobility of uh, people and uh, goods. I wish you all the best for your conference and I'm looking forward in fruitful and interesting exchanges and discussions. Thank you very much. Ron. Thank you very much, Angelos, and indeed Cantonas, our president just mentioned it, uh, partnerships are really the DNA of um, IRF. Thank you, and uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear um, tomorrow in session for, from Angelos, uh, more specifically on a couple of new uh, developments. Uh, thank you, Angelos, and I'd like now to welcome to the stage, all the way from Asia, Mr. Liu Wenjie. Ni hao, Mr. Wenjie. He's the Secretary General of the China Highway and Transportation Society and also of uh, the Belt and Road uh, Transport, uh, the Belt and Road International Transport Alliance, beside being as well the Vice President here at the IRF. Mr. Liu, are you with us? And while he comes on the screen and puts up his microphone, um, he will be speaking uh, Chinese. So for all of you who have uh, joined us a little bit later, um, know that uh, you can use the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom. You will see the interpretation. Select the channel English if you want to listen to this um, uh, to this speech into um, into English. Nihao, Mr. Liu. Your microphone. Yes, we can hear you. 尊敬的各位主席各位同行大家好这个非常高兴能够参加 只能用这种方式跟大家进行交流。我刚才听到了比尔主席的演讲，他谈到了不久前刚刚在中国北京举行的联合国第二届可持续发展交通年会。应该说这个会议啊，引起了世界交通界的非常高的关注。联合国的
，第一个呢就是可持续交通啊、呃，我们认为啊，这个交通的可持续发展是未来我们行业和社会关注的一个非常重要的目标。就是交通它是分发展阶段的，因为我们第一个阶段呢要解决它的基本通畅的问题，第二个阶段呢要解决它要提升它的出行质量和品质的问题，未来呢我们还要。呃，实现智慧化的交通，包括交通减排的问题。呃，这个从去年开始呢，中国交通界对低碳交通、呃、也提出了一些新的发展的思路和理念。在这一次可持续交通大会上呢，中国的国家主席习近平先生也提出了共享交通，包括低碳出行的这些呃要求。因为这个交通的碳排放，在整个社会碳排放当中。占了非常大的一个比例，我们看到美国的数字大概是百分之三十，欧洲呢大概百分之二十五以上，中国呢现在这个交通碳排放占到了整个社会碳排放总量的百分之十，呃，这个可能这里边有一些统计口径的关系，一些问题啊，但是我们依然认为啊，交通减排，未来它对社会的贡献它是非常大的，这些年来这个我们正在建设。一些低排放的，包括高速公路的服务区，包括一些低排放的一些建设啊、呃、工程等等啊，在这方面呢，我们正在实施一个呃新的发展的一个呃这个战略，就在“十四五”期间，就是要大力的推行这个低碳的这种路面的建设，包括低碳的服务设施，包括低碳的我们呃低碳的一些这个出行的工具啊，载运工具，包括。这个新能源汽车等等啊，呃，我们也可以看到一个新的数字啊，就现在全世界是全世界这个新能源的汽车，呃，中国要占到一半啊。这也是由此也可以看到，这个中国政府对这种呃新能源的利用，对低碳化的发展，还是非常非常重视的。呃，最近呢，我们中国公路学会也在跟中国相关的省份的建设部门在进行呃协商。也在推出一些减排呃低呃低碳化的减排的一些呃技术和一些新的发展理念，在这方面呢，我看到我们国际路联实际上这些年来一直推动低碳交通的这个目标实现，而且出台了很多的相关的一些政策，包括一些指数。我们中国公路学会啊也愿意把国际路联的一些新的发展理念，包括其他交通、其他国家一些。好的一些做法，能够到中国来进行实施，来进一步来推动中国交通的呃高质量发展。呃，在这里呢，也再次感谢呃比尔主席、苏珊娜女士秘书长，呃，对这个我们陆联发展所付出的心血啊。刚才很多的这个呃这个专家也谈到，我们非常渴望疫情呃这个好转以后啊，能够呃这个在线下举办一些活动。我们进行更深入的交流。好，感谢苏珊娜秘书长，感谢各位代表，谢谢。谢谢 ，Mr. Liu， thank you very much、uh, for、uh, taking the time to join us. You have、uh, put a strong accent on decarbonization, fundamental point for our sector. We'll be coming、uh, to that throughout、uh, today and tomorrow during our、uh, discussions. And actually, I now want to quickly move to the、uh, next speaker. Our keynote speaker for、uh, today is Dr. Nancy Van Dijk. She is the、um, um, a Syrian economist and also manager of the Sustainable Mobility for All initiative led by the、uh, World Bank. And I'd like、um, Agostina to、uh, assist with this.、Uh, she is, of course, based in the U.S., so has pre-recorded her intervention. And、um, Nancy will be framing、um, this concept around、uh, decarbonization and the vision that is be behind、uh, the basis of of the Sun for All、uh, initiative, in which、uh, IRF is uh, uh, very actively、uh, involved. Agustina, please、uh, play the video. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. It's my pleasure to be here at the annual conference of the International Road Federation, and it's such a great honor to be at, to address such a distinguished audience on a topic that is so close to my heart: sustainable mobility. 
My name is Nancy Van Dijk, and I'm heading the Sustainable Mobility for All Partnership at the World Bank in Washington, DC. In this intervention, I will share my view on where we are on sustainable mobility and what is missing to get there. I'm sure that you all agree that the current transportation system that we have globally is falling short of expectation. Just consider the following. In the next 30 years, there will be 3 billion cars on the road. That means one car for every three people on the planet. When you look at the number of trips taken globally, less than 20% of those are using public transportation. The result of this is maddening congestion that you see across major cities in the world that we now consider business as usual. If you add to that, the number of people that die every year of road traffic accident, a million three hundred, and then the fact that now transport has become the critical sector to reverse climate change, you will, I'm sure, agree that it's hard to demonstrate that the benefits of transportation do outweigh the cost. So this begs the question, what is transport expected to deliver? Now, transport is more than the addition of cars, public transportation, bike, planes, ships, and trains. We also agree that transportation has to be more than land transportation. Considering this, that they continue to work in silo will not make the cut. And then, of course, transport has to deliver more than catering individual needs to travel, to go to work, or even to ship goods from Asia to get them delivered at your door the day after. So what is it? So sustainable mobility is clearly defined and has been clearly defined by the international organization in 2017 around four specific goals. Transport is more than access. It is about making sure that everybody has access to transportation service. That is the dimension of universal access. That's one goal. The second one is we want to make sure, of course, that our transportation system works efficiently, is cost effective, is reliable. That is the dimension of efficiency. And then we want to make sure that our transportation system is safe, and is good for the environment. So next question is, how do you get there? I think that we need to work on three fronts. First, we need more data to evaluate where the transportation system is and what is the gap that remains to be filled between where we are now and the ambition of sustainable mobility. What gets measured gets done. What doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So we need data to guide public decision making in transportation. When you look at data around the world in developing countries, most of them do not even have the data that enables them to map public transit or even to provide schedules of buses. So data is the first priority. Second, you need new technology. New technology can help you generate the data that you want, transform this data into intelligence, and then help you to make the right investment decision and policy decisions. In that context, hyper-digitization has created major new opportunities for transport to do much better. For example, traffic cameras could be used to calculate the density of traffic on roads and change traffic lights based on real-time conditions. This could help reduce congestion or even carbon emissions. New technologies like mobile phone, very simple, can help you create the data in a very cheap way that you have been missing to develop and to design these transit maps. Finally, one could imagine tapping and relying on artificial intelligence 
to automate a number of decisions transport ministers or even agencies have to make on a daily basis or on a yearly basis, like for instance, road investment decisions. So the potential is huge on tapping for on tapping on technology for better decision making. Data, new technologies, very important, but this will not be enough. You need new partnership. Why? The rationale is very simple. Achieving sustainable mobility is such a big endeavor that it cannot be done with knowledge and resources from a single organization. Partnership is crucial to really level the playing field in transportation. And this is what we did with Sustainable Mobility for All when we brought together in 2017 55 international organizations, business associations, private companies with a shared ambition to transform the future of mobility. And the idea of the partnership is very simple, pooling together knowledge, expertise, policy advice and resources so that together we can really make a step change in transportation. Let me just give you one example of what the Sustainable Mobility for All Partnership did, of which IREF is one of the members. We developed in 2017 what we call the Global Roadmap of Action Towards Sustainable Mobility, or GRA. Big name for saying something very simple. It's a catalog of more than 190 policy measures that have been tested around the world to achieve sustainable mobility. To this catalog, we added a selection algorithm that when applied to that catalog can generate an action plan tailored totally to the particular situation of a country. That action plan consists of the top 20 or 30 most impactful policy actions for a particular country, given the problems that this country faces in transportation, to advance on the right path towards sustainable mobility. We are very excited because we are now working with South Africa to pilot the use of that tool and now inform the future program, national program of investment. We are also very excited because we have been, we have started transferring that knowledge and developing capacity in country for using this global roadmap of action and make better decisions in transportation. Last week, we trained more than 600 transport ministers and agencies decision makers in the use of this tool. The idea is that at the end of the day, those decisions that are being made in terms of investment and policy will be fully aligned with the ambition of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. In closing, for thousands of years, we have traveled the planet. Mobility has defined the human race, and yet our transportation system is falling short. So we need to go back to the drawing board and set up our minds free. New data, technologies, and partnership are critical vehicles to improve our chances to reset our system and improve decision-making in transport. That's why we welcome gathering like this one, and we thank IRF for this amazing opportunity to engage with this audience. We have a shared responsibility for present, and future generation to fix the transportation system globally. Now, so join the movement and be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Nancy Van Dyke from uh, the World Bank and uh, the Sustainable Mobility for All uh, initiative. Um, I think she has well framed uh, the um, and set the stage for the conversation that will be taking place today and uh, tomorrow. We have taken already 15 minutes delay on our program, so I'd like Agostina to help me transit uh, all of us immediately to the uh, 
Uh, next session, I'm uh, be mo your moderator for session uh, number one, investing in road safety. Safety is, of course, a central uh, when it comes to sustainability. Um, Agostina, help me uh, in moving forward the slides to welcome to the stage um, our speakers uh, for today. And I'd like to welcome Vinya Mreya, Practice Manager and Acting uh, Global Director of Transport at the World Bank. We have with us as well Malaya Zumel. Uh, she's a Regional Transport uh, Coordinator for Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific at the European Investment Bank. Welcome as well to Annika Henry. She's the head of United Nations Road Safety Fund. Uh, we have with us Jane Newman, International Director for uh, Social uh, Finance. Uh, Dan Chen as well will be joining us. He's the president of 3M Transportation Safety Division. And last but not least, uh, all the way from Australia, uh, Elizabeth Waller. She's a road safety manager at Transurban. I hope they're all with us. Um, I'd like to immediately start with uh, Binya Mreya. Of course, he's in Washington time. So we have pre-recorded uh, this quick chat I had, to, I had with him to really open up uh, this conversation around investments in uh, road safety, a very timely um, conversation, because as you know, the Decade of Action Plan will be launched um, in a couple of days on the 28th of October. And we know already that there's significant um, a short um, uh, underfunding of infrastructure for road safety and the latter need to identify innovative financing, uh, finance initiatives, including greater mobilization of private uh, financing. Agostina, uh, please play the video, Mr. Reya. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Binyam, and uh, welcome. Thank you for being uh, with us uh, this morning at the uh, IRF annual conference. I'd like to start immediately asking you um, about uh, World Bank and um, the Multilateral Development Bank's uh, joint statement. The bank and the MDBs have issued this year a joint statement, a, a firm commitment to an ambitious and integrated approach uh, to road safety. How do you concretely operationalize uh, this commitment you have made in, uh, in the joint uh, statement? Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, it's great to be here um, to participate in the IRF annual conference. Uh, thank you also for the good question. Uh, so the joint statement that was uh, issued by all the MDBs um, was a confirmation of the 10 MDBs uh, to cooperate, support, and finance road safety projects in order to significantly reduce fatalities and injuries. MDBs are streamlining road safety project support within their respective organizations. We have seen new dedicated standalone road safety projects that address road safety issues in a comprehensive and integrated manner. In addition, the road projects include safety considerations in the design of the project, the respective projects. So several projects worth a few billion dollars are in the pipeline for dedicated financing for road safety within MDBs. In the case of the World Bank, a uh, US $1 billion uh, project are in the pipeline that will be standalone road safety projects to be approved this fiscal year. This includes the projects in India, Bangladesh, and Ukraine. In addition, we have seen a sustained effort to integrate road safety considerations in all transport projects. Our focus really at the World Bank and other MDBs is really to scale up our collective engagement with countries to support their efforts to achieve SDG 3.6 and SDG 11.2. We're also making efforts in harmonizing our transport, health, and urban development investment priorities and, pro and, and procedures. Our focus is on the provision of safe infrastructure for all users. We recognize this challenge, this challenge ahead, but you can be assured of our commitment to putting our financing and technical support behind country road safety initiatives.
Thank you very, very much, Bini. I'm sorry, my, I was struggling with my microphone. And I want to, um, to uh, rebond on this. Mobilizing um, adequate financing for road safety uh, interventions was in fact highlighted as a high priority during the third global ministerial conference on road safety, which was hosted uh, in Stockholm in February 2020. What do we exactly need to put in place to realize the transformational change that will help raise adequate financial resources and to bring road safety efforts on the ground to scale. Yeah, thanks, uh, Suzanne, again. Yeah, this is a very important question. Um, there are two things I believe that we can do uh, to really mobilize uh, financing to transform road safety projects. First is I think we, already, we first need to improve the way projects are designed and implemented. There are billions of dollars that are invested in road safety through our many developing countries, low and middle income countries. And there are also quite a lot of financing from MDBs that are going to road safety. So the first order of business is really to improve the way we design and implement projects. This means we have to do an in-depth analysis of uh, what the road safety requirements are, what the interventions that are needed for this. So that's one thing. So do what you're doing already in a better way and a better in an evidence-based informed way. The second thing is we need to really scale up investment in road safety. The World Bank estimates that there is a US $260 billion shortfall in investment uh, in road safety uh, for the next 10 years. So the needs are quite high. So this will require two things. One is the public expenditure framework, the way countries prioritize investment for their road sector really needs to change and needs to show that the expenditure is outcome focused, is targeted to road safety, and it can actually result with some level of outcome. So the fiscal and expenditure management system really needs to be to change and to need to prioritize road safety as an key priority of investment, not just simple infrastructure. Second is that we need to diversify the source of funding and financing. We need to look at the new source of revenue, new way of uh, attracting private sector or introducing new innovative financing. So this is what I would think, I think for that. Thank you very much, uh, Binyam. And I, I'd like to uh, stay on this last point you mentioned about and ask you more specifically, uh, what is the role that you see uh, private sector could play in all this scenario uh, that you have just described? Yeah. So the private sector already plays quite a bit of role in really road safety, mostly on the service side, such as uh, vehicle testing, making sure vehicles are safe, uh, etc. We see that um, there are also some other uh, m small minor uh, aspects that the private sector does. But the biggest uh, return is going to be if we can get private sector investment in the road infrastructure itself in making sure road safety is included in road infrastructure or they can invest there. So we are working uh, as a World Bank group, World Bank and IFC, working together with um, IRAP and the FIA to look at what are the different options and mechanisms to attract private financing for road infrastructure. So this can include uh, making sure that the PPP structures, the concessionaires, are, they have a road safety requirements that they can actually invest on improving uh, the, the road or upgrading them to a better road, more safer road, and then get a return out of that. Uh, it also includes looking into the sustainable debt market where uh, there's quite a lot of sustainability linked or SDG linked social uh, bonds or whatever different kinds of instruments that are out there and incentivize uh, the private sector, institutional investors, uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds to invest in road safety. However, in order to get projects to be invested or, or private sectors to invest on uh, road safety interventions, we need to first create projects that are investable. So the problem is road safety hasn't gotten the, the 
interest of institutional investors because there is no clear, well-identified project. So what we are doing is try to, what we call projectize a road safety intervention, meaning identify what the costs are and what the returns are going to be for investing such uh, uh, aspects. So, well, so I think the, the work that is being done now uh, will look into how the, we can quantify the different costs and then look at the stream of revenue to actually pay back this cost and create basically a, a project and a, a financing structure that's going to allow uh, the private sector to invest on this road safety. So we're very excited about this prospect of looking into uh, mobilizing private capital into road safety and uh, hopefully stay tuned and uh, we may see more uh, private sector financing going to, the, to road safety in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Binyam. Investable projects, that's exactly the key word. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in the rest of the, the session together with, the, uh, with our distinguished uh, speakers to today. Um, stay with us, maybe on remote, and um, I'll, I'll move to the next uh, speakers now to deep dive in some of the uh, critical issues you have been mentioning in your intervention today. Thank you very much, Binyam. Great, thank you, Susanna, again for the invitation. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. And here we are back uh, live. Um, and I want to stay, in fact, with the multilateral development banks now. And uh, welcome to the stage, uh, Malaya Zumel. Malaya, if you can um, come to the stage and open up your video and your uh, microphone. Malaya, are you with us? Thank you, Susanna. Can you hear me? Yes, see me. Now we can hear and see you, and see you well. Yes, I was saying we, we stay with MDBs, and indeed, amongst the MDBs, um, European Investment Bank has been really a champion when it comes to facilitating um, sustainable investment. So I'd like you now to uh, bring us forward in this conversation, tell us about um, uh, the commitment of the bank to sustainable uh, development and inclusive uh, growth. And also uh, coming from that sustainability uh, experience, then how we draw that parallelism with, um, with road safety. Malaya, you have the floor and I have the difficult task of being the cop in the room because we are running um, really short in time. So roughly eight minutes for you. Thank you. Of course, of course. Thank you, Suzanne. And a big congratulations to the IRF, not just for today, but for the great work you do throughout the year. Uh, I'll start very quickly. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you may know me as a road safety coordinator or the, of the European Investment Bank or as a facilitator of the MDB Working Group on Road Safety mentioned by Ms. Reja, but I'm actually here in another capacity. I am also one of the coordinators of the EIB Sustainability Awareness Bonds, uh, responsible for bonds that impact transport and mobility. So before I joined the EIB, I worked at the Dutch Treasury for six years, working on sustainability and development finance. And one thing we loved at the Treasury was accountability. The links between accountability and the needed clarity that precedes it, as well as impact on the grounds, have never been more important. The ultimate goal after all of this new decade of action is not just to finance safe roads or to build an X amount of safe roads, but to have the number of deaths and injuries on roads worldwide. I'm here to present the EIB example, how we have concretely made these links for other sectors and what it could mean for road safety. Next slide, please. So at the core of this is the importance of having sustainable finance as an operating model. It requires political will and backing. It's not always easy in a world that is often driven by volume and speed of delivery, but it is important nonetheless. So how we contribute to sustainable development and inclusive growth is by mainstreaming environmental and social sustainability into our own decision-making processes. We also require our clients to align with an EIB environmental climate and social standards and its accompanied policy. We ask project promoters actively to implement the necessary actions that are sent from their application, and we support them in doing so when needed. Supporting the application of relevant principles, including through methodologies and procedures, to support the environmental and social soundness and sustainability of all operations is very important to us. Also, improving the contribution of our finance to sustainable development and inclusive growth is done by prioritizing sustainability and sustainable activities in our lending portfolio. 
and undertaking relevant policy dialogue at different levels, international to local, um, such as the one we are having today. So next slide, please. How does this translate to the capital markets and the sustainability awareness bonds or the SAPs? I'm just here to give the EIB experience. Ideas start at the technical level, but they are often catapulted by political will. One of the key questions at events such as this is how to engage policymakers and budget holders. One of the answers is from the top and with every hook we can get. In the EIB's case, it was our president speaking at the UN, one of the summits, we committed our bank to increase efforts to achieve the SDGs. We in turn recognize that road safety is both an important target and a strong enabler for multiple goals pertaining to health, climate change and inclusive growth. It is important that our partner countries recognize this too. As Mr. Liu Wenji emphasized in his intervention, safe, accessible, green and efficient mobility and sustainable roads are key to sustainable development and growth. We cannot emphasize that enough. Next is the private sector and public demand. We envisage that in the near future, at least half of our investors will ask for bonds that are not just triple A, but with strong environmental, social and governance criteria. This means that if we want to engage the private sector, if we want to have, uh, have them buy our bonds, we'll need to really, really step up what we do in the sustainable bond market and link them to sustainable projects on the ground. Compound this with a credible foundation due to the release of social and sustainability bond principles, following the green bond principles by the International Cap Capital Markets Association. This is a very important aspect because this gives um, our bond issuance the credibility needed and uh, an external voice to, to underscore what we do. And finally, it takes an institution, in this case, the EIB, that commits itself to only use the proceeds of such bonds to fund eligible projects which have benefits that can be quantified and assessed. And this is so important for the accountability that Mr. Reja mentioned in, uh, in the goal of the MDBs. It's not just ambition, but it's also to be held accountable to show for the fact that we are actively contributing to this new decade of action. So the EIB, just to take a step back, as you may know, is the bank of the EU with projects in some 160 countries inside and outside of the EU. Next slide, please. Last year, the EIB group, consisting of the EIB and the European Investment Fund, signed around 77 billion worth of projects. To fund its activities, the EIB alone raised 70 billion euros in capital markets. Now we have the luck to be part of the EU system enshrined within its treaty. And the EU has decided that capital markets are there in part to serve sustainable development. Again, this shows the importance of leadership. That said, a G20 report on green finance concluded that the lack of clarity as to what constitute re constitutes relevant activities and products can be an obstacle for investors companies and banks seeking opportunities for investing. We need to help create that clarity. Although it does not require a one size fits all approach, internationally comparable indicators are useful to facilitate investments and to evaluate their performance and to analyze the macro implications and impact of activities. So back to transparency and accountability. Next uh, slide, please. And the core features of both uh, CABs are climate awareness bonds and the SABs. So let me highlight some key points. It's important to note that bond issuances must follow disbursements, at least at the EIB. Not project approvals or signatures, which means that this could be money sitting on our account, but actual money flowing to projects on the ground worldwide. Eligibilities are decided upon board approval and reviewed upon these disbursements, making the case an imperative one. It's a lot of work, especially for, uh, for technical staff such as myself, because we have to really make that case. We have to, um, uh, to make that case for every board approval, every time we go to a board and for every disbursement within uh, those specific loans, we have to make this case. It makes definition so very important and a clear and agreed upon taxonomy lies at the base of this. In our case, the EU taxonomy on sustainable finance, which is now being extended from green to broader environmental and social issues, is the leading, is the leading, uh, the leading taxonomy. We will have to be critical and clear about why and how any particular project will contribute to our goal. And data is key here, as emphasized by Dr. Van Dijk. Moreover, at disbursement, we will have to verify that our goals and key performance indicators linked to them have not changed. 
So if policy changes, if the KPIs change, this will also change the disbursements and how we account for them. Furthermore, there shall be no double accounting and no right refinancing of sources we accounted. So we are sure that the projects we fund or what we count towards our sustainable bonds are really linked to projects on the ground, counted just once. And funds remain where they are until they are used for the specific purpose of sustainability. Last but not the least, allocation and impact reports are published. And now my treasury heart beats faster. We are audited by an external party, in this case, by KPMG. They use the standard for assurance of non-financial information, which consists of guidelines for the ethical behavior, quality management, and performance of all engagements. This is also very fundamental for the, for the concept of accountability. Next slide, please. So this is where we are now and how the market has grown in the past decade or so. We started with climate awareness bonds, those are the green bars, and gradually, gradually started issuing sustainability awareness bonds, the red bars. It's encouraging to note that this past year alone, our SAB bond placement was oversubscribed by 15 times, indicating a strong demand that more and more will need to be addressed by more and proven sustainable projects. The sectoral eligibility so far have been in water, health, and education, and we're exploring the pathway to expanding eligibilities to other sectors, including transport, including for safe and sustainable roads. So we have come a long way, but for road safety, we're still relatively at the beginning. Luckily, a way has been paved, and we like to think it's one of financial and social integrity. So when we talk about the billions that we've issued and the billions we've approved, we talk about billions um, of projects that have actually contributed to the global goal of having deaths and injuries worldwide. So as, as Susanna mentioned, we are behind on time. I don't know if there's a space for a Q&A, uh, but if not, uh, I, I know there's a Q&A function and I'll be happy to answer questions there as well. Thank you. Back to you, Susanna. Thank you so much, uh, Malaya, and apologize. Yes, we are running a little bit uh, behind schedule, but I invite all the um, attendees to use the question and answer function. You can take a look. If we are not able to uh, answer those questions today, because I know you're, all of you, uh, the speakers, also other commitments, we'll try to come back uh, to you, and there will be more coming on, on this uh, critical topic uh, going forward as, as we look into ways to uh, implement the new decade of action plan that will be launched at the end of the month. Thank you very much, uh, Mal Malaya. I'd like to transit now to our next uh, speaker, um, Jane Newman. She's Inter International Director for uh, Social Finance. Um, Jane, if you can open up your uh, video and your microphone. Uh, what I want to touch base um, uh, with you is uh, really on this uh, concept of, of uh, social impact investing and impact investing and really um, uh, probably explain start by explaining uh, to some of us who are here connected uh, who are not familiar this concept about uh, impact investing. Jane, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna and um, to IRF. Um, it's great, um, great to hear the intervention so far and to be part of this session in particular because investment is clearly so, so important. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen um, and um, uh, put up a, uh, my uh, presentation, a couple of slides. The two topics that I want to talk to are briefly explaining uh, what um, we mean by impact investing, because I realize that may, may not be um, a familiar concept to, to many people. Um, my screen, I think, is just coming up at the moment. Um, uh, can you see that now? Uh, yes, but you should be uh, use the other display settings where we can see the yes yeah. there and then yeah. the top. Yes, just up. Thank you. Um, so, as I say, I want to talk about uh, what impact investing is and um, and then what um, what the uh, role for road safety might be uh, for impact investing. So, let me just describe. Um, impact investing. Um, I, I should have another slide coming up uh, just now uh, for a moment, which will show what that. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, um, keep talking. We we may want to uh, display it ourselves. I think we have it. 
Um, so I'm, uh, impact investing um, sits on a spectrum uh, of, of investment uh, from traditional investment uh, across to uh, uh, philanthropy. Um, it, um, it, 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 um, if you can uh, uh, imagine that um, a traditional investment uh, really focuses on the return that investors are seeking, uh, whereas um, the, I'm going to put this up anyway, um, uh, versus um, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, if, if it generates impact, that impact is usually a byproduct of the investment. Impact investing um, is much more intentional about the impact that it's seeking to, to create. Um, it may have a broader uh, approach to the return that it's seeking on investment. Uh, it may be uh, more concessional than a traditional investment, but it sits along a spectrum from tr um, traditional through environmental and social to more impact, intentional impact investment. Um, it's different uh, from concessional capital, and it's certainly different from um, uh, philanthropic capital. But one of the um, interesting elements of impact investing is that uh, it's a form of investing that can blend different forms of capital in different investment structures um, so that um, you can bring all of the incentives of the parties together and align towards the same impact goal. So in that sense, it's a, it, it's a very powerful instrument for change uh, when you're looking um, at, at um, a sort of purposeful uh, at goal. So um, what do we mean by impact? Um, on the, um, um, and clearly um, uh, impact uh, could be um, a broad range of society, societal gains. It could be reduction in disease, it could be tackling youth employment, um, um, it could be uh, climate, climate gains. What you need to have is clear and measure, measurable societal goals. And of course, when you're, we're talking about road safety, we're talking about clear, measure, measurable um, uh, road safety uh, goals. Um, so I think I'll leave the slide up um, as I continue to talk about the role that impact investing can play in road safety. Um, as it's already been discussed today, there's a significant investment gap for road safety. And the World Bank has mapped that at 26 billion annually uh, for the next decade. Um, and there is opportunity for impact oriented investments across the si uh, safe system for, for road safety. Um, and it's evident um, um, from um, uh, a discussion already, including um, from the European Investment Bank, that a purposeful approach um, to investment. Um, uh, and uh, in road safety um, can create positive um, social impact, not just in terms of um, uh, lives directly saved or injuries avoided. Um, it has wide reaching costs to, to society as a whole, which are, are very difficult to, to capture. So take, for example, um, in a, a low income country where the family, family breadwinner is, is killed or seriously injured from, from a road incident. Um, as we all know, that can lead to catastrophic household costs. Uh, the family may lose its main income. Uh, they may then, as a result of that, lose their home. Uh, that might lead to the children not being able to attend school or finish their schooling because they may need to work and support the family. And that has a huge knock-on effect um, and societal impact, which is a kind of um, uh, avoided uh, cost of um, um, uh, poor road safety that we're, we're seeking to avoid. And when we put it in these terms, the positive impact from better road safety is, 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 very, is, is very evident. And impact investing really aims to capture the narrative and um, um, uh, capture the benefit um, uh, from, from improved, improved road safety. Um, so, so what does this mean in practice? Well, 
there's, there's clearly an opportunity to harness the momentum behind green investment and climate investments. Um, if car manufacturers or mobility providers want to access sustainable finance markets and raise money at more advantageous rates, um, it makes no sense to, um, to, to focus just on um, uh, green, um, uh, a green agenda for uh, their manufacturing. Um, it would make sense also to put road safety targets alongside uh, the green and climate targets as part of those investments. Another example could be um, a payment by results investment, where public and private investors can work together uh, to achieve road safety benefits. And this type of impact investor investment, um, the funder of um, an intervention may only be able to justify making that investment if it can see, have line of sight to verified um, road safety benefits, where the monetary or social benefits outweigh the cost of actually um, making the intervention. And in these cases, you might think of a, a social imp impact bond uh, model, which is a form of impact investing, where investors provide upfront investments, and then when verified road safety benefits are achieved, uh, the ultimate funder, that might be the government, it might be a development funder, there may be a philanthropic component in there. The ultimate funder would repay the funding because they have seen the benefits and they've been quantified. So when you use this kind of model, um, because um, the investor is taking risk as to whether or not those benefits are going to be achieved, you need to have a much more granular understanding of what the impact is. It forces you to measure it, it, that helps build the data uh, and the evidence, and in turn, uh, makes the case for investment. Um, and, 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 and in time as well, it, it will broaden the range of investors who can come together. So the private capital um, and public capital can work um, perhaps with philanthropic capital and, and blended finance. So perhaps um, just to um, to give illustrate that example, um, take an ex example of an investment, um, a low cost, high impact um, investment in pedestrian infrastructure in low or middle income, low income countries, say in Africa. There, the upfront finance is, is repaid when the measured improvements are delivered. Now, we're not just talking about improvements um, for hard infrastructure for laying pavements, putting in crossings. We're talking about the benefits from that, which depend on usage um, and how pedestrians uh, use the infrastructure because it's their usage that will translate into lives saved. Um, so that's my intervention. My apologies that the slides um, didn't quite work at the beginning, but I hope, um, I hope I have been able to illustrate impact investing and how it might be used in, in the safety context. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. It's been uh, extremely helpful and um, really complements what uh, the uh, MDB speakers have uh, have been saying. Um, I need to move forward with the session because we are running late, but I, I, I'm sure this has provided a good food for thought for future conversation and we'll be happy also to uh, take advantage of the ex expertise in that uh, going forward. Um, now, from uh, lending to funding, I'd like to bring to the stage uh, Enika Henry. She's the head of the United Nations Road Safety Fund. Enika, I hope you're with us. If you can open up uh, your, um, your video and microphone while I say goodbye to Jane. If you can close your video, she can come up to the screen. Enika, there you are. I can, I can see you well. Um, Yes, good morning, um, Enika. So you saw on, on the slide from Malaya, lending, funding, and here we couldn't have a better speaker to uh, talk uh, about funding for, uh, for road safety and the role that uh, the UN uh, Road Safety Fund uh, plays into that. Enika, uh, we're struggling with time, but uh, please take us away with, the, with some uh, key uh, insights on the, onto this uh, topic. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much, Susanna, for having uh, the UN Road Safety Fund in on this important discussion. Um, I will be I will be trying to be brief. Um, so the UN Road Safety Fund, as folks may know, it's it's quite a new player um, to the global road safety agenda. 
um, and really set up to help uh, the low and middle income countries where we know most of the, 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 the fatalities and the injuries are occurring to help them reduce those numbers substantially. And we're trying to do this by not only supporting countries with the prioritization and the mapping of, of where they need to, to put the focus, where we'll have the highest impact, but supporting them and, and channeling some funding there to uh, some seed funding to really get some proof of concepts, some benchmark projects to show that with further investment and with further scaling, we can really substantially reduce those numbers. So we're trying to get the priorities set uh, through country leadership. We're trying to get projects in so that we can showcase what financing road safety looks like, what it can achieve. And of course, um, as Nancy had alluded to in her uh, keynote speech, a lot about it is, is partnerships and crowding in. And I think that's the strength, uh, particularly of the UN, having um, this ability to convene the different partners. So, um, you know, there's a big focus on infrastructure and we've heard about the life-saving um, possibilities of those from the MDB uh, uh, world, uh, but there's a whole lot more that needs to get done. And that's where um, we're particularly focused. Most of our projects, 70% of them that we funded so far is really looking at these interventions around vehicle safety, um, you know, standards and speed management and really looking at the legislation and, and capacity building. Um, and so here to do that, we're really trying to crowd in as many players as possible from insurance, uh, from ministers of finance, mayors, youth entrepreneurs, really trying to, um, to, to build in these partnerships to, to lead on that. Of course, as a fund, we're focusing on the low and middle income countries. Um, and, you know, the truth be told, there are a lot of countries that are already prioritizing road safety. It's not as if the countries are not doing a, um, in a lot on their own already. But I think where we can add a value as a UN and, and UN partners is really to ensure and to drive more of a whole of government approach to this. I think this is where the better designs and the better uh, prioritization will, will take place if we have a whole of government approach. Um, and also ensuring and supporting governments um, that the interventions that they do prioritize and focus on have, are the ones that have the highest potential of, of substantially reducing the deaths and injuries because um, you know, advocacy is great and campaigning, but it's not enough. We need to showcase that um, projects need to be looking really at you know, things like infrastructure, speed management, enforcement, um, use of technology um, and the rest of it. Um, just to confirm from where we sit that this underfunding of, of, of road safety agenda, particularly as you talk about low and middle income countries is a reality. We, in the first um, two, three years of existence of the fund, we've received over $100 million worth of country requests. And because of the, the financing that we, we have, we were only able to meet 10% of this. So only 10% of the needs in the last two years coming to us have been, have been met. Uh, and we've delivered this through um, 25 projects in 30 countries. So I think um, maybe here I will, I will stop or pause in case you have any, any questions here. Um, uh, Susanna? Yes, so thank you uh, very much, Annika. And, and, and of course, uh, as you speak, I see questions popping up in a question and answer and uh, specific questions, whether Sri Lanka, for example, is included in, uh, in the range of, uh, of countries, but, but uh, maybe these questions can also be answered um, separately. Um, the fund has a fantastic website, um, newly uh, redesigned with plenty of, uh, of information in, in, uh, in there. Um, Annika, I, I, I want to take a, a little bit uh, more of, of your time um, and also it will help me uh, transit then to the next intervention. Um, um, what do you see as the role of the private sector? Mm, we know that the fund is also supported by private sector, a different type of private sector, so there's foundation and, and companies. Um, in, in a couple of words, uh, what do you see as its role and, and what would help uh, engage more private sector? Thank you for the question, Susanna, good one. Um, just to say for the fund itself, um, very unique to the UN system, we, we do work quite a bit with the private sector. In fact, for every $1 we get from ODA, um, uh, we actually are leveraging about $3 from the private sector, which is unusual for, for UN fund. Uh, and we're, we're happy about that and happy about the engagement of, of private sector on this. Of course, they're not a homogeneous group. Um, we have uh, big players who can support in the infrastructure, as our colleague from the World Bank was speaking about. But as I said, there's a whole lot more for us to do. So private sector who have that scale, they can help us with our awareness raising, um, consumer facing fundraising, uh, particularly through these mobility on demand kind of companies. Um, companies 
companies that are having you know huge profits they can channel uh, into the pool of funds uh, that are going to low and middle income countries on this agenda. You have companies who have that influence when it comes to vehicle standards and other standards, so they can play a role there as well. There's also the possibility to, to you know, play the role as mentor uh, as we talk about capacity building and knowledge transfer, thinking about uh, many companies I've speak, spoken to, you know, dro from using drones to help with the, the health pillar of this road safety agenda. Um, speaking to one of the companies that was uh, in Malawi and Rwanda, using drones to deliver assistance um, to road traffic uh, uh, victims. Um, so I think um, there's a lot of space there for innovation as well from the private sector. So depending on the, you know, the strength uh, of, of the company, I think there's a lot of space there for the collaboration of private sector. And it's important for all of us, including the UN, to really um, uh, demystify to private sector, whether they're small scale or large scale, that there is a role for them to play um, and, and to really engage them, even if it's through pilot projects where we say, okay, proof of concept, you know, your technology, your innovation can work in South Africa, can work in Nigeria. Uh, and as, as our colleague from the, the World Bank was saying, help them to see that there is going to be a return on investment in certain countries um, in the developing world. Thank you so much, Annika. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rushing everybody, but we're really behind schedule, but it's exactly perfect, uh, perfect asset. You serve me to uh, move to the next uh, speaker. We, we have asked uh, 3M um, Dan Chen, who's actually supporting the fund, exactly to talk about what is the role of uh, the private sector in all this and how they can contribute. Thank you very much, Annika and Agostina. If we have the video a presentation of uh, Dan, who is also sitting in the US, so pre-recorded. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dan Chen. I'm with 3M. I lead our transportation safety division. I just really want to express my thanks uh, to Susanna uh, for this opportunity to share some thoughts um, with your IRF annual meeting um, about inv innovation for safer roadway infrastructure um, and coming out to you from a private sector perspective. So just a few topics I want to cover. One is uh, incorporating roadway safety into the business culture. Second is innovation in corporate social responsibility. And the third is in creating frameworks and markets for roadway safety. And I'll use kind of more of an analogy than a direct approach on roadway safety. At 3M, we have the benefit of um, having several businesses uh, in our company, which are really safety focused. Um, worker safety, food safety. Now have the privilege of leading our, our effort in transportation safety. Um, we've been at this for a long time. Um, you can see the history from 1930 to Today, um, I won't get to go into the details of this, um, but it's really taught us a lot about how safety can be part of a business culture. Safety is a is a great uh, is a great business, is a great market, energizes our organization uh, more completely. You get to interact with some fantastic individuals, um, but it really is um, an opportunity for us to think about safety more holistically, and has brought that forward into into our company in the main. But for companies who are not directly involved in safety, there's also opportunities to think about roadway safety and make that part of the business culture. And I'll bring this forward to this slide here, which is really about opportunities for the role for the private sector. And um, these were came out of the academic expert group. Um, for those of you at Stockholm, that presentation of, of that um, the findings, one of them really was about how the private sector can influence uh, through procurement, essentially. Um, roadway safety. And it's really about um, procurement in all its aspects. I talk about procurement directly. So it's making sure that you have suppliers, uh, partners, others who are um, safely uh, operating their fleets. Um, it's directly the fleet management. Um, that can be your direct people that are in the sales force. It can be people that have uh, transport related activities. And thirdly, it's really about safe operations within the four walls of a factory, it can be how you conduct operations logistically and so forth. Just the power of the purse, if you will, the power of how we set policies as a private sector entities can have a tremendous influence on, uh, on roadway safety. And again, the details uh, outlined again in that academic expert uh, report. So I want to highlight that as well. Turning to the subject of innovation, 
Uh, in private sector, we oftentimes stay within our, our swim lane and we do what we do well, which is uh, trying to provide value for our stakeholders, shareholders, employees, and our customers. Um, but at the same time, we can be creative in how we approach uh, what we do in our in our business lines, but also expanding that to partnerships and road safety. And I'm showing here some of the organizations we have the privilege to work with at 3M. Um, a lot of familiar names on there. A lot of them, I won't go into the detail of each of these, but they bring expertise in a particular area and offer the opportunity for us to learn more about what the problems are, what the solutions are, work together cooperatively on solutions, whether they be policy solutions, could be technical solutions, could be about assessment. Um, so this opportunity exists for, I think every company in the private sector is this opportunity to partner. Uh, and we just encourage that as being part of making um, that creative part of social responsibility um, be a synergistic effect um, through partnerships with other organizations. Because the problems we're trying to solve are simply too, uh, too, too hard, too big to do it alone. This is really uh, boiled into, and from a 3M perspective, and many other companies as well, in this innovation, corporate social responsibility, and kind of this incorporation of it into um, how we do work. Um, Mike Roman, who is our chairman and CEO, has made this statement about 3M. Um, and, you know, at it, a it, it, certain level, it sounds maybe too uh, high reaching, but it's really about solving some of humanity's greatest challenges, something we take to heart um, in every organization that we have, um, that, that we have within 3M. Um, and I think we have this benefit, certainly from the work we do, to see this come to life and make corporate social responsibility something beyond writing a check um, and you know having it as important as that is. Um, it's involvement, whether it be at a local level, national level, global, or simply raising awareness and advocacy. So there's a bunch of examples on here. Um, the opportunities for us are to get our employees engaged in these projects. Uh, our opportunities to learn about new markets, learn about um, new opportunities, both from a business point of view, but also certainly from an outcome point of view in terms of improving road safety. So certainly I think that um, what we try to do, and I think many companies are trying to do the same thing, is really to bring that purpose to their organization. Um, it's energizing to all of our stakeholders involved, and I think it's something that we want to continue to do going forward. I'd like to pivot now and talk about the third and last thematic, which is really about the power of markets and the power of the private sector uh, in making scalable change in our society. And I'm going to use an analogy here, which is another market, which uh, not directly road safety related, but tells you about how the private sector and the public sector can work together to make change. Um, so energy production historically has been one of the most conservative industries um, in very high dependence on, on reliability, very high dependence on traditional fuel fuels, fossil fuels and, and the like. Um, and you've seen this tremendous growth and I see the growth here, show the growth here of um, global solar module production and solar energy production um, in gigawatts. And you can see this fantastic growth. It's really propelled by an all of the above strategy that an entire ecosystem which is produced by policymakers um, by uh, financing mechanisms, whether it be renewable energy credits, taxation mechanisms that provide incentives for renewable energy generation. And the private sector contributes its part, which is the innovation piece of it, um, creating scalable solutions. You see that in the light blue line, the cost of solar modules, the cost of solar energy production dropping so dramatically over time. And it's really that private sector innovation coupled with this framework, which is made by public policy financing uh, entities that have produced a success story and the benefits for it from a global environmental and energy, energy production point of view. And so I just want to leave this thought with, with all of you that you know we can, as people, as entities in different sectors, combine together to make significant change. And I just want to keep that in mind as we think about roadway safety. Um, from a 3 perspective, I'm open to engage with anyone who's got ideas, anyone who has um, things that they want to propose. 
Um, we can't do everything, but um, I think it's certainly contingent on all of us to listen to each other about ideas and what we bring forward. And hopefully that session uh, will be part of that, that activity as well. So with that, thank you for um, the, your attention this time and I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity. Hope you have a good uh, rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dan Chen, and we stay now with the private sector, and I uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage last, but not least, uh, Liz Waller. She's the road safety uh, manager all the way down from Australia, Transurban. Uh, good evening, actually, uh, Liz, and welcome. We we'll, uh, we'll left you uh, at the end, uh, but also because we want to uh, conclude this um, great journey we have just had this morning with a concrete example of how we go from aspiration and strategy into action. Leeds, you have the floor. Thank you, Susanna, and thanks to the IARF for inviting me to come along and speak at the conference. I'm, as, as Susanna said, I'm just going to cover off, you know, really the value of embedding road safety into the private sector and go through the example that, um, that Transurban is. So would you mind going to the next slide, please? So um, what we have is have, have set a very ambitious target along with uh, a lot of other com countries and, and companies around um, getting to zero at some stage. So the commitment for this came right from the very top. So our chief executive and the board um, are very serious about safety and it goes to uh, our employees, our contractors, the people who use our roads. Uh, and we have 21 of those roads across um, Australia and North America, and they uh, are made up of 1,300 lane kilometres. Uh, we also have three transformation projects in um, our markets as well, and that's uh, obviously about building um, uh, toll roads. Um, we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, and in 2020, we rated fourth on, in the transport sector on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. So just in saying that, you can understand uh, the, the uh, commitment that we have around uh, safety and sustainability. Uh, Two million trips occur every day on our roads, and we have nine million customers and road users. So it's really our ambition for uh, the community and, and people on our network, and actually beyond our network, to have a five-star journey every single time. And that five-star journey means that they're going to be safe and get to their destination uh, without uh, being involved in a serious incident. Um, in 2016, we adopted the safe system approach uh, to underpin our road safety strategic approach. And you can see here, this is our own diagram um, from safe system and it envelops um, our our purpose, and that is to strengthen communities through transport. So uh, everything that we do sits around safety, um, not just on the roads, but in everything um, across the business as well. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the most important things that we did in um, embedding road safety into the business was to establish internal uh, key performance indicators and also benchmark our performance. So in 2015, we our own um, measure is the road injury crash index. So we measure uh, injury crashes on our network. And the definition for that is when someone is transported by ambulance uh, from that crash site um, and measured by vehicle kilometres travelled. Um, we also have established regional road safety action plans uh, and that those plans are implemented to uh, support the reduction in crashes. Um, and then we also measure other uh, performance targets such as uh, near misses and non-injury crashes as well, looking at the speed on our network, how we managed that, the lane compliance and, and a few other things. And critically, our road worker safety incidents and near misses are right at the heart of what we do. We have lots of people on the network, on the road uh, and working near live traffic uh, every single day. Uh, pleasingly, um, in this period of time, uh, in, in setting the targets, you can see in that very little graph um, that we have achieved, um, or you won't have said that we have achieved, but we have actually achieved our target in the last two years. And it hasn't happened by accident. You know, we really have um, put a lot of effort into developing our people and their understanding of road safety. And I'll get to that in a moment. But secondly, and really importantly, um, as well as setting our own um, uh, measures and, and reporting on those, we have independent um, 
benchmarking of, of our network. Uh, in Australia, Monash University Accident Research Centre undertakes a regular crash analysis. And the last uh, analysis showed that our roads were 1.9 times safer than like roads. So we're, we're looking at uh, motorways and freeways of a high standard in urban areas. Um, and there's uh, reasons, of course, for, for the safety of our network compared to others. And we'll get to that um, soon. Um, we have also IRAPed our roads and um, both in Australia and in North America and all of them are a minimum of three stars and if you look at the, the, um, the two small boxes you can see that uh, we have a very high rating of four star or better across Australia and for almost two thirds in um, North America. So um, we're, we're, we're pleased with this, but I think it goes to um, being able to talk to the community, to your, our own employees, to investors, uh, just about the, the value of safety, uh, you know, in the private sector um, and, uh, and being able to, to use this and present it in our corporate reports is, is one way uh, for that, I guess, the value of safety to be uh, expressed and understood. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we, but we, but getting there really is a, a joint effort. We don't do that by ourselves. Uh, we uh, rely on the people in our business. We have lots of partners and also um, we uh, have stakeholders. And those stakeholders are really important because they're the ones who are investing or, or talking about us and they're going to help us in achieving uh, that vision of zero. There's hundreds of people across our business that are focused on road safety every day. And um, embedding that road safety leadership and capability uh, means that our people, our contractors, the partners that we work with, really do understand the safe system approach um, and are able to apply that to their work. And that's whether they're in our road operations or our technology teams, and they're the ones who are always looking at, at how we can improve road safety, how we can actually keep the people using our network as safe as possible. And it also goes to um, our procurement teams, you know, our communications teams, um, and uh, even those who, who are looking after our incident response. So understanding road safety, what it really means, and how how um, we can uh, embed that in people's DNA essentially is one of the ways that um, we've been working very um, you know, carefully on and um, very deliberately to achieve what we have um, to date. Next slide, please. So um, in talking about that capability, um, you can see here that we're also around accountability. Uh, we are report against nine of the SDGs and three of those we link with safety, obviously goal three and goal 11, but we also look at industry innovation and infrastructure as part of this as well in goal nine. Um, we have um, uh, road safety is called out explicitly in our sustainability strategy, in our customer promises about how people are going to be able to use our network and also in our social investment strategy. Um, so, and that's now become an expectation of our investors and that um, comes through in our, S, um, in our ESG reporting as well. Um, we have developed our own safe system professional development program and that's really uh, critical for uh, our people to be able to understand the system and, and how they can apply that in their own work. So in how they uh, look at um, when we're de designing or enhancing our road network, how we look at the standards, how we can uh, you know, go beyond th those standards to make sure that what we do every single time is safe. Um, the, um, the one here that's, that's really important when I spoke about IRAP, of course, it is um, the the road safety performance targets three and four, you know, obviously sit uh, under three, but there's a lot of things that we do. And I'm going to just quickly um, talk about two things in the next slide, if that's okay. So um, we, we heard from Dan just then about the investment and the partnerships, and we certainly do that as well. So um, in terms of innovation, um, we have a, a tunnel in Melbourne called um, Burnley Tunnel, and the it, like lots of tunnels underground, and this one goes under a river, there is a sag point or it's a very big dip that goes down, um, goes down and that creates uh, 
a lot of congestion, a lot of slowdown. Um, there's a lot of uh, behavioural science and human factors around this about people not being able to see the horizon uh, when they're coming out of it. So that causes congestion, it causes um, slowdown of traffic, it causes incidents on the network and also more emissions than what we, we would like uh, in a tunnel environment or, or any part of the road. So um, innovate, using innovation, we rather than being able to just sort of um, think what could we do to this tunnel to help uh, people get that through there more uh, smoothly and without incident, um, we, we uh, set up a virtual reality uh, program and put some of our customers uh, through that to understand what the experience would be like if we enhance the tunnel. So we'll just play that video to show you what we did. So this is the current um, tunnel as it looks now, and this is what the enhanced um, environment would look like. We measured uh, the response from uh, our customers and what was quite interesting was that their uh, focal distance increased dramatically uh, when they were in the enhanced environment. And we're now going through a scoping exercise to, um, to address uh, the, the, those issues in the tunnel um, using some of the enhancements that uh, we had trialled in virtual reality. Uh, the second one I just want to share with you is that we've invested with uh, Neuroscience Research Australia in um, the Transurban Road Safety Centre. So the, all of the, uh, the child restraint standards in Australia, or many of them in the guidelines, uh, came from, uh, we'll call it Neuro, um, Neura, which is short for Neuroscience Research Australia. And um, they created a new lab and we have uh, their sponsor in this. So they do um, a lot of research in this lab and it's not just around child restraints, but if you play the video, Tom will um, let you know the work that's happening at the centre at the moment. Well, thank you. Should be able to click on that one, Agostina. What you just saw was a crash test on our state-of-the-art crash sled. It can travel up to 60 kilometres an hour down these tracks till we reach the impact zone down here, which is where we simulate what happens in a real crash. So we conduct road safety research to reduce the risk of injury to people in crashes. That includes testing car seats like these, but also other vehicle safety systems and even motorbikes. Thank you. So, um, so going, uh, th this also helps um, and demonstrates the commitment and it is a very genuine and authentic commitment. Um, and uh, you know, our customers are very interested in this. Our investors are incredibly interested in what we do in this space. So I just have one more slide, um, which uh, talks really about um, our, our purpose. And I mentioned that earlier is to strengthen communities through transport. And you can see in our strategy, we're looking at sustainable transport solutions um, and it's around reliability safe, and safety and value. And you don't make, we don't see the word road there. We very much are around um, these transport solutions. When people talk to me about road safety at Transurban, I talk to them about how we um, focus on optimising our networks and that's for safety and also making sure that we deliver very safe um, assets. And doing that, we get this incredible stakeholder engagement as I've been talking about through this presentation, but also very disciplined investment in what we invest in, but how our investors see us as well. This is really um, taken up. We get lots of inquiries when it comes to our AGMs and other investor days, um, but it really goes to demonstrate um, our commitment and our leadership in road safety and certainly supports our, so our social license to operate. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you very much, Elise. And I'm sorry that I have to um, rush everybody, but um, we have taken a good part of the next session. My thanks to all the speakers um, in uh, session one. We'll be coming back to you for the questions uh, offline. I'd like to now pass uh, the mic to the moderator of the next session with my apologies for uh, the delay. Um, Dimitris Mandalotis is the Chief Operation Officer at the Agent Motorway. Dimitris, your uh, microphone and video on, and then we'll Good let morning, you... good morning, Susanna. Good morning to, good afternoon or good evening to everybody because we have so many people from different parts of the world. I would like to uh, proceed immediately as we are uh, running out of time. So uh, today we're discussing about the IRF innovation updates and I would like to, uh, to introduce our uh, uh, panelists or presenters. Uh, first of all, uh, Valerio Molinari, who is uh, uh, from uh, company Eco Guest, 
It is um, uh, his position is from the company's majority shareholders. Emma McLennan uh, from the Eastern Alliance for Safety and Sustainable Transport, uh, which director, and uh, the third one is our uh, Zinia Kakisi. I hope to say it pronounce it well. Uh, he's a professor, assistant professor uh, from the Smith Democracy University and Turkish Road Association. So I will pass immediately the floor to Valerio. Uh, Valerio has, you have five minutes and then we go to the, to the next presenter. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. My name is uh, Valerio Molinari, and I'm the majority shareholder of uh, Exus Company. Uh, thanks to ERF, thanks to Susanna, thanks Bill uh, for the uh, invitation to speak at this uh, here annual conference. Starting from the 50 years experience of Ecogest, uh, the leader company in the sector of maintenance of uh, roadside vegetation along roads and motorways in Italy, and promoted by its holding company, Greenway Group, the Climate Change Study Center was established in November 2020. The CCSC Promoter Committee stems from the collaboration between Greenway Group, the founders of the Cassandra Project, and some of the leading Italian experts in ISCAT and in ISCAT Servizi, in order to monitor the impacts of climate change on transport infrastructure. The purpose of CCSC is to provide useful information regarding resilience, is to promote the exchange of good practice between operators and end users and to propose related project initiatives and research and development activity. The starting point is the scientific facts. Over the past uh, 115 years, the global average temperature has risen by nearly 0 0.8 degrees and by around one uh, degrees in Europe. Without concrete action to limit future emission, the global temperatures are expected to further increase by 2100. Several effects of climate change have already been observed on soil and vegetation, such as anticipation of flowering periods, lengthening of the growing season, changes in natural cycles of plants, and uncontrolled spread of invasive alien species. These effects produce and will produce in the future a great impact on the state of the health of infrastructure networks. A new approach is fundamental so that the infrastructure can be protected and every maintenance logic can be in step with the times, with the renewed needs and with the consequences of climate change. The CCSC began its journey in Italy with a proposal to Italian concession for the development of projects and research activities related to the resilience of motorway infrastructures to climate change. The first project is a pilot study consisting of an analysis of three sections of a motorway operated by CAV, Concessioni Autostradali Venete, in north east part of Italy. Throughout the Cassandra innovative methods, this study analyzed the state of the sites and identifies a resilience index based on the Cassandra study parameters proposing different scenarios to identify an optimal solution based on the resilience index achieved. The study is intended as demonstrative of the functionalities of Cassandra, and now by acting on the parameters, the infrastructure's resilience index of the analysis section can be improved. Cassandra is an integrated decision support system that facilitates the creation, development, and management of the resilience and sustainable cities and infrastructures with the control over all phases from design and execution up to maintenance and management. The application of Cassandra along the motorway operated by CAV SPA will first allow to point out current critical use issue in terms of resilience to climate change and impact on the quality of life of users or those who live in the vicinity of the motorway. By creating a digital twin of the selected section, Cassandra will allow the modulation of different scenarios to improve the critical issue 
found in the current state, such as noise pollution, improvement in air quality, biodiversity, water management, or visual pollution. A database of parameters will allow to represent real quantitative and quantitative data, quantifiable and scalable to larger sections of the motorway, with the final goals of giving an overall view of the resilience to climate change index of the entire motorway operated by CAP. The main objective of the study is to identify potential critical issue arising from or caused by structural, vege vegetational, morphological, hydraulic, or landscape elements currently present along the analyzed motorway by monitoring, analyzing, and assessing a series of parameters throughout the application of Cassandra. The study will allow to hypothesize a series of ecosystem environmental mitigation and compensation measures that at a later stage can be included into detailed design. Uh, it will also make it possible to identify the best intervention to be adopted in order to optimize both technical and economically that infrastructure and green areas maintenance and management plans is increasing the period of full efficiency of each infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valerio. So uh, from what I understand, because the, this is a very interesting uh, presentation, we see that there is uh, a connection between uh, the climate change and the general condition of transport infrastructure. But I have a question for you, more specifically about Cassandra. So why is Cassandra uh, so unique? Uh, Dimitri, yes, thanks for the question. Cassandra is the only multidisciplinary and fully comprehensive IDSS that reach high levels of geographical accuracy. It is the only IDSS directly linked to accept quality of life uh, uh, indexes and is the only system that allows for the prioritization of economic in areas where they will have a great impact on residents. And it is the only SS capable of measuring and visualizing positive action by an individual at the same time of an entire community. Okay, thank you very much, Valerio. So uh, we are going to our next uh, speaker. Uh, good morning, Emma. Uh, so we have with us Emma McLennan. So uh, Emma, the floor is yours. Yes, please, I, I need to share my screen. So, uh, if you could, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I'm Emma McLennan. I'm the Director General of EAST, the Eastern Alliance for Safe and Sustainable Transport. We're an NGO. We're actually a network of organizations working across 15 countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I'm also the deputy chair of FireAid, which is a charity I helped to establish, which gives direct support to low and middle income countries with improving post-crash care and response. So why is this an important issue? Uh, because we know that the decade of action, the new global plan for the next decade is calling for a reduction in traffic deaths and injuries by at least 50% during that period. Part of the global plan includes post-crash response as an important feature, one of the key pillars. And the World Bank and other researchers have estimated that something like 30% of all injury deaths could be saved in developing countries through better trauma care. So this is a great opportunity for achieving those global goals, which we're all committed to. So with that in mind, the World Bank Global Road Safety Facility uh, supported and the European Bank for Reconstruction Development initiated uh, a project by FireAid and the George Institute for Global Health, Health and East um, to do a capacity review in four countries uh, on specifically related to post-crash response. And those are Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Lebanon, and Egypt. And in all those countries, we looked in detail, working with local partners and all of the rescue services 
in, in, into issues about their equipment, their training, their coordination. And we found very similar problems. Uh, there were problems with organization, with location data, uh, with planning. The equipment base was extremely poor. And based upon this, uh, we've produced for the European Bank for Reconstruction Development a post-crash emergency response toolkit, uh, which is available in English, Russian, Tajik, Kyrgyz, and Arabic. And uh, we'd be happy to discuss this with any of the attendees here. In addition to that, we've produced six training videos, which capture some of the most important key things that we need to do to get post-crash response right. For example, intervention at the scene, how you organize that, um, coordination and data, equipment and training, all of these things are very important. I'm happy to share links on the chat line, which I'll do after this presentation. Finally, as part of the project, we commissioned an analysis by Agilisys, who are very brainy people, who calculated the cost benefit ratios of investing in primary emergency care as set out by the World Health Organization in the four countries. And I should add that when you invest in good post-crash care, you get added benefits in people in emergency services responding to other uh, important emergencies, such as heart attacks and other crises. So uh, the, the most dramatic response we found was that uh, with the investment required in Lebanon, you would have a, a, a ratio of 57.3.5 uh, um, uh, times every dollar that was spent uh, in investing in post-crash care, but in all countries. I should say these are low, very conservative estimates. We all used conservative um, figures. So the, the post-crash, investing in good post-crash training, equipment, organization and care is not only uh, incredibly important for saving lives, it also is an, a good investment and saves money. And on that, I'll end it. And as I said, I'll put in links to uh, the resources that I've mentioned in the chat, but my email is here. If anybody would like to, to, to get in touch, I'd be happy to, to contact you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. And I would like to apologize, apologize to you and to the rest of our attendees because we don't have time for, for, for questions. So I would like to immediately pass the floor to our next uh, presenter, uh, who is uh, Mr. Zia Kakisi. I hope to pronounce it well. Uh, so, uh, Zia, the floor is yours. And... Yes, I can hear you, but can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, yes. Yes, okay. So, I need, I need to share oh. my screen, uh, please. Yes. Before uh, my presentation, uh, I should point out that uh, this study is a part of uh, my PhD thesis. Uh, uh, supervised Professor Yeti Sazi Murat. Uh, thank you, dear Dimitris. You can see uh, my presentation outline on this slide. Uh, my presentation consists of uh, five parts. Uh, the, uh, I refer these uh, part, part by part. Uh, economical and technological de developments all over the world uh, bring about increase in the number of uh, vehicles. With this increase, the most of road networks has been inadequate day by day. Many decision makers uh, think that this problem can be solved by building more new road networks. Uh, but this is not an appropriate and reasonable solution. Uh, instead of building more new road networks, uh, the improvement of existing road networks may be more uh, sustainable and reasonable solution. An effective traffic signal control is one of the most used application to improve the existing road networks. In the literature, 
the number of studies considering both signal timing and signal phasing optimization are very few. Therefore, uh, we developed in the scope of this study, we developed any signal timing and signal phasing optimization based traffic management model, SPOTM. In the developed model, signal timings and signal phasings are optimized simultaneously. And in addition to this, both signal timing and si signal timings and signal phasings are updated dynamically at regular intervals. Because the differential evolution is an effective, easy, flexible, and powerful algorithm, we preferred uh, this algorithm in the scope of this study. You can see uh, the basic step of differential evolution algorithm on the figure. Delay uh, is important uh, performance parameter for signalized intersections. It is used for determining the performance and the level of service of signalized intersections. Uh, for, as can be seen from the figure, uh, this uh, parameter consists of deceleration delay, stop delay, and acceleration delay. Webster, HCM, and Archeric delay models uh, are the most used and well-known delay models, while Webster and HCM aim to phase-based signal design, Archeric aims to movement-based or lane-based signal design. In this study, lane-based traffic volumes for the signal timing optimization and conflicts of traffic flows for the fast plan optimization are considered as determinant factors. So we use actual delay model in the optimization process. In the scope of the study, we created two different inter uh, signalized intersection models. One of them, uh, the first of them, uh, has three leg and eight lanes. The second one has four leg and 14 lanes. We considered uh, three types of intersection management model on the scope of the study. One, first one, optimum fixed time management, OFTM. The second one, vehicle actuated management, VAM. And the third one, GLAST, signal timing and signal fuzzing optimization based traffic management, SPOTM. We applied this uh, intersection management model uh, on both three leg and four leg in, uh, signalized intersection models. For OFTM, green signal timings are constrained between seven seconds and 45 seconds. The degree of saturation volume for each lane is constrained with a maximum of 1.2. For VAM, the order of phases is variable, minimum, maximum green signal timings, arrival headways of traffic flows, and placement of detectors are determined uh, considering previous studies in the literature. For SPOTM, Lane-based traffic volumes are used for optimizing the signal timings. Merging, diverging, and crossing uh, movements of traffic flows are considered for optimizing the signal fuzzing. For three-leg and four-leg signal intersection model, eight and 21 possible fast plans are created, respectively. You can see a uh, flow chart of SPOTM. In the scope of our study, firstly, we created 42 traffic volume scenarios, which have different to, uh, which, which have different total traffic volume from each other for both three-leg and four-leg signalized intersection for testing the effectiveness of SPOTM. Then we we analyzed each scenario with VSIM simulation software considering OFTM, VAM, and SPOTM separately. At the end of the study, we concluded that. Uh, for, for three-leg intersection model, we determined that uh, average vehicle delay may be reduced by the rates of uh, average of about uh, 45 and 35 percent with SPOTM comparing to OFTM and VAM. For four-leg signalized intersection model, we concluded that the average vehicle delay may be reduced by the rates of average uh, about uh, 30 and 15 percent with SPOTM comparing to, comparing to OFTM and VAM respectively. I want to finish my presentation. Uh, an American urbanist, uh, Lewis Mumford say, building more roads to prevent congestion is like a fat man loosening his back to prevent obesity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zia. Uh, uh, very interesting results. Uh, I would like to pass the floor again to Susanna for our next session because we don't have time for 
Uh, questions for Susanna? Yes, thank you very much, Dimitris and Zia. If you can stop sharing your uh, screen, so that will allow us to uh, move uh, forward. Uh, thanks to the moderators. Thanks to the to our members who have been presenting some updates uh, from their side. Uh, keep pushing your questions in the question answer function. Uh, we will make sure you get answers uh, probably offline. Uh, now we're getting to session, the second thematic session of uh, the day and the last for this, um, for this morning. And um, we welcome uh, the uh, moderator, Angelos Bekiaris. He's the director of the Center for Research and Technology uh, in Greece, uh, CERT. And uh, Angelos uh, will be handling um, a, a, a very impressive lineup of speakers. I'm really uh, looking forward to these uh, presentations. We're talking here about unleashing the potential of digitalization. Angelos, your video and mic open, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, we have a dream team here. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing all these uh, super experts. And uh, as time is pressing, we start uh, right ahead, uh, Susanna. So we start uh, with Do Dr. Clarissa Hahn, uh, that she's an international leader on sustainability and resilience in the Australian Road Research Board. Um, and her presentation will be on infrastructure, digitalization, and mobility future. Clarissa, the floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. I'm just trying to share my screen. I think now I'm able to do that. Is that coming up? Yes, now we can see it. Great. Thanks, Chairman. I'm Clarissa Han. I'm from the Australia Road Research Board. I'm the national leader of sustainability and resilience. Um, very glad to utilize this 10 minute slot to share some of Australia's latest research and progress in the area of infrastructure digitalization and integrated mobility future. Australia Road Research Board was set up 60 years ago by Australia and New Zealand federal state road agencies collaboratively aimed to set up a centralized repository of independent transport knowledge. Um, over the past six decades, our mission and vision have evolved significantly. Today, we have a strong focus on sustainability, connectivity, integrated mobility future, and of course, innovation. So I will share a few aspects from big data to the digital infrastructure, to the infrastructure readiness in order to support the future cap operations. Starting from data, we dedicated and committed to work with data from the national perspective. We set up a national transport performance center in order to measure, benchmark, and monitor the road network performance across the board. So this is our first national crash map. Um, you know that our state data doesn't really publish. And the way um, the crash data was coded and registered in different systems very differently, enormous effort was made to create a, such a consistent reporting structure. So that covers last five years fatalities and serious injury. The next, the next map is the um, traffic data covering the speed and volume data, our capability to access the national database enable us to realize the road network level intelligence. One more map shows the traffic, con um, the road conditions. The data came from our in infrastructure measurement group where we maintain a fleet of net network um, survey vehicles that we connect um, and collected the road conditions data like the strengths, uh, the cracking, rotting, and roughness and frictions. But all of these data systems doesn't operate in silos. The real power comes when we start to incorporate, in, in, integrate and combine this data together. So I'd like to show you an example. Uh, in order to illustrate this, we have created a new set of performance indicators. 
um, such as a driverless frustration. We not only consider the measured congestion by speed and delay, we also take into consideration the road conditions, the road space that is available to our drivers in order to measure the um, driverless frustration. Look at this map. This is a typical uh, weekday PM peak. The driver's frustration along our Melbourne freeways is indicated on this color-coded map. I'd like to emphasize um, our next uh, wave of data came from the connected vehicles or vehicle-enabled data. This is another example I'd like to mention that we were able to utilize the data coming from the HERE technology map. Here is our research partner. So this um, technology map was made available to many connected devices, such as vehicles, um, watches, or smartphones. So the data came from these devices covers a wide range of information, not only the speed and location, but also um, many information from vehicle sensors like the wipers, the hazard lights, and the radar. We were able to incorporate this data and create a hybrid model and ditch uh, fusion to be able to fill in many gaps of our congestion and reliability assessment. There's still a lot of potential to further utilize the, this data to fill in the gaps of our road conditions map. As Australian New Zealand National Transport Research Organization, we constantly uh, investigate or monitor the technology trend. So the investigation has confirmed that the cloud connected vehicles are coming. Our vehicle OEMs are providing increasing level of uh, data connectivities. Per our investigation, um, as shown in Austro's uh, Future Vehicle 2030 report, it is envisaged that by 2030, majority of the vehicles sold in Australian market will have certain level of data connectivity. At the same time, with the global growth of the 5G sub subscriptions, it is also expected that more than 50% of the uh, mobile phone traffic will be carried by the 5G network by 2026. All of this enable great potential opportunities for our road agencies, public sectors, and industry bodies um, to create uh, cloud-enabled connectivity. Of course, there are many challenges, such as data exchange protocols and standards, cost-benefit identification and assessment, and also the service level commitment and arrangement. Um, but we have to be prepared. Um, Advi. So the Drive This Vehicle Initiative was founded and initiated by ARP since 2015. Since the September 2015, our Australian and New Zealand road agencies started to conduct all sorts of AV and CAV trials across our road network. Our ADV is a um, public-private collaborator or consortium. By now, we have more than 150 partners covering three sectors, the government agencies and regulators, the industry technology providers, and of course, the public consumers. The mission of FADV is to um, safely accelerate the adoption of driverless vehicles in Australia and New Zealand. Another news is we have just concluded our two days um, ADV summit 2021 yesterday. Do check our website to find the latest, please. On top of that, we also conducted a lot of work in order to measure our infrastructure readiness uh, to enable the future um, automated, fully automated or partially automated driving operations along our road network. This map shows a about 90, we have about 98,000 um, kilometers of freeways and highways in Australia. And we have conducted a enormous road, uh, road audit in 2019, which covers about 25,000 kilometers of, of our freeways and highways. Um, that is equivalent to 90,000 map links, 8.4 million um, line segments, and also covering 8,500 8, road signs. Our survey vehicles equipped with the latest module of machine vision cameras, which is just the same as whatever available on the market with ADV or ADS. And the driving tasks covering um, the um, selected even distributed uh, freeways of both uh, regional and uh, rural areas. 
um, across have coverage of all the Australian states and New Zealand. So the key attributes we look at for this survey covering both the um, digital infrastructure and physical infrastructure readiness. Um, the audit or assess result can be illustrated using this map. For different types of infrastructure element, we were able to comment on the confidence levels at different segments or links of the roads, um, like high, media, and low. Our inf infrastructure is also assessed um, in a comprehensive way in terms of highly likely to be suitable, may be suitable or unlikely to be suitable for selected assisted and automated driving functions. We were also able to provide a large list of recommendations or comments on the current readiness of infrastructures and of advice on the infrastructure change requirements and standards that will enable the future automated drivings. Um, before I conclude my short talk today, I'd like to quote a architecture model that was proposed by my app colleague, Dr. Charles Kao, um, on a architecture um, layer, so six layer models uh, from bottom to the top, covering um, the necessary system network um, or system network elements that will be um, that will be integrated. Larissa, sorry, sorry, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, maybe you should conclude because of the time, of the time pressure. If possible. No worries. Thank you very much. And sorry. Thanks, everyone. Um, stay no, you can, you can still have your conclusions. You can still have your conclusions if you like. One minute, okay. if you want. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, then I just a brief introduce this little um, model, six layers um, from the physical infrastructure at the bottom covering our roads and device. Uh, then the digital infrastructure cover the cloud connectivity, Wi-Fi and emerging technologies. Data is sitting on top of that coming from different sources. Logical element is the um, safety, operational and the regulatory element that would support a safe and efficient operation of this ecosystem. Processing and services are sitting on the top to provide this uh, seamless services to different road users. So our future mobility will um, benefit significantly when the services are integrated and all the services will critically rely on the cloud connected data in the near future. So this is what we call the Australia pantry. That's it. And stay connected with us via the social media or the website. And thanks everyone for your time. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, uh, Clarissa. I'm personally very impressed. Uh, you seem to have the eyes uh, quite ready uh, across uh, Australia for CAV, and you are calculating CAV readiness. I think you are at least one step ahead of Europe, maybe more, but uh, really impressed. If there is any important question, uh, we could go to that. Otherwise, uh, because we are delayed, we can move on. But uh, I don't see any hand, so I hope that uh, we can go on. I will come back to you because, um, personally, as I said, uh, there are many lessons that we in Europe can learn from what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move to the next speaker, uh, who is Federico Di Gennaro, the head of strategic projects, uh, Omicron project, AIS Katsarvici, and he's going to talk to us about Omicron project and especially boosting the automation of infrastructure maintenance. Very interesting, automation in infrastructure maintenance. Uh, so Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Thank you to all of you. I'm gonna share my presentation here. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening to all of you. I'm honored to have been invited to speak at this very important event for IRF and for the entire road transport community. Even if we are not in person, I'm glad to see a lot of colleagues and friends among the attendees, and I hope to shake your hands and have a dinner together very soon. In my presentation today, I will try to give you some interesting information on how to improve road maintenance procedure thanks to new technologies and solutions. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce you the Omicron project, going step by step, discussing the main concept, the main solution that will be developed and tested, and where and how we will validate the Omicron full solution. 
As you can see, Omicron is a project funded by uh, the European Commission within the Horizon 2020 program. There are 16 partners from seven countries for an overall budget of 5 million euros, 100% funded. The project started in May this year and it will last for 42 months till October 2024. Semosa, which is a Spanish engineering consultancy company, is the coordinator of the project. ISCAP is involved as co-coordinator of the Italian demo site together with the Strade Parchi motorway company. The objective of the Omicron project is to develop an intelligent asset management platform specifically designed for road infrastructure, which will improve the whole asset management pipeline focusing on four main pillars. The first pillar is composed by a set of solution to improve the digital inspection activity, taking advantage of the combination of drones, terrestrial vehicle for inspection, integrating also real-time information coming from V2X communication and road maintenance. The second pillar will be made by the design and integration of a road digital twin using information coming from digital inspection data as well as from other sources ensuring the capability to use information from legacy system and to guarantee the interoperability with existing tools. The third pillar is the design of a maintenance decision support tool for roads using the information coming from the digital twin. Omicron's intelligent platform tools will be integrated to support decision-making process of infrastructure managers and operators. The last, the fourth pillar, is made by the design of a multipurpose modular robotic platform covering key emergency, ordinary, and extraordinary intervention actions, improving the safety of workers and enhancing the training capability. Going more into details, we would like to further implement the cooperation among different long-range UAVs for inspection, allowing different drones with different roles close views, long range views, communication relay, in the inspection by including different sensors and communication system. Regarding the inspection vehicle, uh, we will develop a, a ground vehicle inspection solution to collect a great variety of information through images and to process them, such as the computation of the IRI, friction and deflection coefficients in roads using artificial intelligence techniques. Then. Um, uh, we will deploy also B2X communication in the field of road maintenance by using standardized CATS services, such as maintenance vehicle approaching, traffic, roadworks, warnings, weather condition, and so on. Another component is the modular platform. Omicron will develop a semi-automated mobile manipulation concept formed by a robotic arm, which operates autonomously mounted on a standard vehicle in order to improve the safety and easiness of installation of road signals on both left side and right side of the carriageway. Then a vision system will be developed to identify the presence of signals and estimate the relative position with respect to the robot and control logic to generate the trajectories and to activate the cleaning tool. Another tool uh, is related to the automated installation and replacement of safety barriers that will be done by the robotic arm, which will take the barriers and place them in the right position, minimizing in this way the risk for workers. Then another tool is made by the removal and painting of horizontal markings, which is a very common and critical task. Omicron will deploy a laser head for paint removal to be operated with the modular robotic platform, avoiding the reduction in the friction that can result in a risk of slip for vehicles. Then, uh, regarding the sealing of payment cracks, the current process will be automated by the use of a modular robotic arm, which will be able to operate the pipes of the machine and apply the bitumen over the crack. Then, Omicron will also automate the surface payment layer rehabilitation activity, providing decision support information along the whole process in order to improve it and in order to enhance human operator decision, leading to reduction on the overall cost of payment by increasing its useful life.
Then uh, we will also develop a web-based virtual reality platform that will be utilized for the teleoperation of the robotic resources from a remote and safe environment. It will allow users to control the navigation of the robotic resources in real time. The development of augmented reality tools will support in-field road workers and will enable an improvement in the management of maintenance works, providing also better information capabilities that will optimize the resources used ensuring better safety condition during the intervention. The road asset management platform will integrate all the various technologies developed in Omicron, providing an enhanced control center with a full visualization dashboard for road operators. This will provide a more realistic experience of the state of the infrastructure and the management of the work to be carried out on the road using multiple information coming from multiple sources. The technologies uh, will be tested in different sites, according to the level of development and in three main stages. Stage one will test the UAB, the modular solution for bridges and the robotic platform in a lab scale. Stage two will test the solution deployment on a real scale in three different sites, a virtual one, uh, which is the overpass of a A3 highway in Portugal. Then the second demonstrator will be on the M30 in Madrid. The demonstrator number three and four will be respectively the A92 in Spain and the A7 in Spain, part of the Mediterranean Safe Corridor. Then the final Omicron platform will be tested and validated in Italy on the A24 highway in the central Italy. Going to the conclusion, uh, innovation without impact is a waste of resources. So the project results will be measured using KPIs related to the impact of the technology for the safety of workers in the reduction of the traffic disruptions, the routine maintenance cost, and measuring the increase of the network capacity. I would like to close my presentation by remarking the importance of innovation and the added value of introducing new cost-efficient technologies to improve motorway operational activity. I really hope to be invited again by IRF in a couple of years to share with you the advancement of uh, our very ambitious projects and to enjoy the conference in presence. Thanks to all of you for your uh, kind attention. And for any info, please contact me or the project coordinator from SEMOSA, Mr. Jose Solis Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, you did more than you uh, said. So not only automation, but we have seen augmented reality, virtual reality, a full bouquet of new technologies applied in this uh, in the sector. I think impressive, and uh, indeed uh, we are looking forward to see the results of your pilots. I think that would be uh, very good um, when you have uh, reached TRL seven and you have your pilots and you can compare the before and the after, I think extremely good. Is there any uh, any specific question? Uh, I, I, uh, see none, uh, yes? I see none, Angelos. I'm monitoring the question answers for you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, please. So is there any? No, go ahead. No, Not go ahead. So thank you very much, Federico. We Thank you. Uh, move with, uh, uh, Estibaliz Baranyanu, I hope uh, I say it well, sorry for that, the general manager of Asimov company, Asimov, uh, who is going to take us from the maintenance part to the road inspection, quite near, but also different. Uh, he's going to speak about AI for automated regular road inspections, and we are very happy. The floor is yours, uh, Estibaliz. Thank you, Angelos. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to, to everyone. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about how we use artificial intelligence for automated, automating regular road inspections. So these are the inspections that are visual inspections. There's usually a person from the maintenance team driving hundreds of uh, kilometers a day, just checking visually that everything is OK. Um, now, that's not very efficient because anything this person doesn't see or forgets gets, does not get reported and does not get repaired. So road authorities, if they want to, uh, let me see if I can, yeah, if they want to keep a, a, a good knowledge of what's going on with awareness, they need to perform thorough detail inspections that are slow and labor intensive, normally dangerous and, and fully manual, except for the uh, the well uh, when when this uh, the solution that Federico just presented for Omicron 
But even though these inspections are expensive, so they are done every several years and usually only in the main highways. So the secondary road networks or other ne networks that do not have this kind of resources don't get this kind of, of care. And there is a need of, of, of good maintenance in, in, in the roads, especially this secondary, uh, secondary road network. That at least in Europe, that's where the vast majority of road fatalities happen. And they don't have these detailed maintenance uh, inspections. So what we from Asimo propose is to use new technologies to uh, use automation in a solution to do increase the frequency, the systematic uh, the frequency of this, these systematic inspections so that critical elements of the roads uh, are, can be monitored daily, weekly, monthly, bimonthly, however often is, is, is needed. And for that, we have designed a flexible process that is affordable and not so labor intensive uh, that leaves traceable results so that authorities, road operators can keep good track of what's going on and what needs to be repaired. And it's error free because, of course, artificial intelligence does not get tired, does not forget, uh, and does not get distracted. So, um, our solution is composed of three main uh, parts. Uh, first is the data gathering part. Uh, we installed small, lightweight commercial IoT devices on board fleet vehicles, normally the, the maintenance fleet vehicles that are going to be driving along the roads that we want to, um, to monitor. And these devices will operate autonomously, automatically, uh, gather video and data of the road and send it to the cloud where our servers uh, will analyze it using our AI, especially designed for road maintenance. We will extract the relevant information and make it available to the road maintenance team in a user intuit in very intuitive and user-friendly interface at the traffic management center or their offices. So, the onboarding the installation of our devices is, is very easy to do. It's an Android, maybe a dash cam, depending on that, a OBD connector. Very small, very lightweight. It takes minutes to, to install them in any type of vehicle, and it's automated. So the driver just needs to press the button, and everything, the data gathering, where and when needed, will be done uh, without any intervention, intervention from the person who's driving. And the... the um, the devices will also send automatically the, the information. So there is no action needed from the driver, no extra work for them. Now, what can we do with it? Well, first of all, we can uh, detect automatically all vertical segments. So we analyze the video that we gather and look for all the traffic signs and, uh, that, we, that we find. With that, we can automatically create a digital geolocated traffic sign inventory is driving up and down a road and, and we have the, the traffic sign inventory. After the inventory has been reviewed and approved, we can support the regular inspections, weekly, daily, or however is needed, so that each and every traffic sign can be systematically reviewed uh, every as often as, as needed. We also enable the remote monitoring of roadworks areas, which are dangerous areas that must be signaled in a, in a correct way. So what we produce from each inspection is a map with the traffic signs and the very easy to spot the incidences. Uh, for every traffic sign, there is information about the, the last inspection that was performed. Very easy, just a couple of clicks in, and uh, from the traffic management center, they have access to the video recorded of that uh, traffic sign or the missing traffic sign if, if it's not visible, and also a panel view so they can very easily uh, check for minor damages like stickers, graffiti, branches that are starting to cover uh, the, the traffic sign or, or the colors, uh, the, the condition of, of all the traffic signs. So these are a couple of um, use cases. Uh, the first one is checking the inventory. So inspection, an automated inspection was, uh, was performed against an inventory and the two new signals marked in green there uh, appeared and there were two missing signals marked in red. So just a couple of clicks and from the traffic management center, they could access the video to check that, yeah, the inventory was actually updated in that case. 
Another use case is roadwork signage. Of course, it doesn't come in the inventory, so it's marked in green for an incident, new traffic sign detected, and just a couple of clicks and the, the maintenance manager can go and see how and where those uh, signs are, are um, installed to check if it's the correct installation in the right place. Another thing that we can do, we can detect irregularities in the road surface. Uh, we can we are use accelerometers and we are adding computer vision to that so that we can detect the cracks, potholes, sunken manholes, and, and this kind of irregularities evaluate the effect on, on, the, on the vehicles and the, on the driving comfort and register the evolution in time. <clears throat> For each irregularity, we provide a map so with the scale of, of, the, of the impact to the, to the vehicles, uh, details about its pothole, direct access videos so that a preliminary visual inspection remote, can be done remotely, and also the historic data so that we enable decision making about where uh, the uh, most uh, urgent uh, renewal works need to be done. These are a couple of uh, use cases detecting where the cracks are starting to appear uh, so that they can be uh, detected as easy as, as early as possible so that repair works take as less money as possible as well or registering the evolution of a, of a, of a, of a in, in this case expansion joint. Uh, we are we we work towards the autonomous inspector. So we are completing our functionality with more uh, things. And in the next few months, before the end of the year, we will have ready the horizontal signage uh, monitoring. So we evaluate the visibility of lane markings. With that, we will have the complete horizontal and vertical signage monitoring. And it's important to stress here that improving road signage has proven to be the most cost-effective way to reduce the number of accidents in, in roads, especially secondary roads. So with that, we will have covered all, all the signage so that road operators will have information of where to act and what is important to repair or to maintain. Uh, we're also developing a project to uh, detect water, ice, and snow on the road, and we will continue with safety barriers and other crucial elements of road safety. We have a modular design, so um, we have uh, the data collection, data processing, and client, in, um, client interface, as I showed. We can work with images, uh, geolocated images from third parties, and we can integrate our results in existing platforms if needed. So we are very flexible in that. And this is the team. Uh, we are senior technical profiles from different brands like technical services, the ITS uh, sector, software development. We have several awards for our innovation and we proudly have to add the IRF startup label now, which we are super proud of. And we have already done pilots and projects with public authorities and private uh, road maintenance companies. So far only in Spain because we are a startup, but we hope to expand this, this, uh, this work. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Estibaliz. Uh, indeed, uh, impressive and uh, an impressive start. Also, with um, winning uh, quite many uh, awards. Um, I have uh, some questions, but I think I've seen some interesting ones. Uh, maybe uh, I can be helped uh, by Susanna. There was one that was asking about if you can understand the color or the decolorization of the lane. Can you maybe um, read it? Uh, for the lane markings, yes, I, I can uh, I can read it out for you. It's yeah. in the chat, so please yeah. um, put your question in the yeah. question function because it's difficult yeah. to paste them back. Yeah. Would Asimo remote inspection system be able to characterize the color and re retro reflective performance of traffic signs for day and nighttime performance? That is key. Having a sign in place does not mean it meets the standard. Okay. Uh as I said, we have a very flexible approach uh, and we lose accuracy for giving this flexibility. So we do not measure anything. We cannot measure retroreflectivity. You need a special material for that. What we evaluate is visibility. Is it visible or not? 
if we if if our uh, of our computer vision that does not see it, probably a, a driver will not see it as well, and an ADA system will have difficulty in seeing it. But we don't provide so we provide evaluation. Is it visible? Is it not visible? We don't provide measurement. That's that's sure. the, the yeah we had to. Uh, uh, this this affordability and this flexibility would means that we have to give up some some uh, accuracy for that. Very clear. I think it's probably enough uh, for the road operator to know that there is a problem there, and they can measure only in the face of the problems if they want more. It's, exactly. it's I think clear. Mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of time, I will not take another question here, uh, but you have all the data, and I think uh, there are many many things. Um, to go deeper because indeed um, impressive work. Thank you very much, Estibaliz. Thanks. And uh, in, with that, um, we move to Monica Olis Lagers, hopefully. Uh, that is the Global Innovation Manager of IRAP. And um, very interestingly, we are going to hear how IRAP scheme is using big data for road safety, from AI to big data. I think we are here on the very edge of technology today. So, uh, Monica, the floor is yours. Great. And thank we you, Angela. Um, yeah, excellent. We can see your That's good to know. And thank you to the IRF team for the invitation to talk today. It's really lovely to be with you all, even if it's just virtually and not in person. Uh, so I'm IRAP's Global Innovation Manager, as Angela introduced me, and I wanted to talk to you today about our AIRAP initiative. But before I do, I just wanted to um, touch a little bit on uh, the conference theme, which is charting pathways to sustainable mobility. Uh, road crashes have an extraordinary human toll on a daily basis, and, and this equates to an economic cost of around six billion US dollars per day. Uh, if that figure sounds um, a bit sort of out there or unrealistic, it actually in, in per person terms averages out to around 60,000 uh, US dollars per person and, and per, per life. So that's counting for either a fatality or a lifelong injury. And this, this cost is, is being paid for by somebody. It's being paid for by families through loss of income. It's being paid for by our, our health and hospital system. It's being paid for by lost productivity from employers. It's being paid right across the every economy around the world. And so I just wanted to bring back this back, back to the concept of sustainability. It's not just about environmental sustainability, which is incredibly important, it's, but it's also about social sustainability and economic sustainability. And so why is safety critical? Um, the challenges are very real. Uh, we've got increased urbanization. Over half of the world's population now live in a city of some sort. Um, population is on the rise in many, many places, particularly in cities. You've got increased motorization and, and sort of these growth of high mobility roads. Uh, speeds and motorization, ownership of vehicles is, is steadily increasing in many parts of the world. Uh, but you've also got this, this sort of need for better urban transport and a real shift in recent years to more mo more light mobility modes as well. Uh, the picture you can see there actually runs straight through my neighborhood. I live in a city of 18 million people in Guangzhou in China. Um, and, and this is a reality that I have to face in my daily life every day. And so some of the issues come from the fact that safety um, is dealt with in quite an ad hoc way, if at all, during the, the road planning phase, during investment decisions, during design, um, right through to construction and maintenance. And the evidence of this ad hoc approach is in so often we end up with roads that just totally lack uh, sufficient uh, facilities and safe facilities for other road users, pedestrians. And the evidence is in uh, this stubbornly high rate of fatalities and serious injuries we see around the world. Uh, so we really do need to start thinking about safety as really being central to all of the systems and processes we use to, to manage and build and maintain our road systems. 
So what, what's IRAP? I think many of you have probably heard of us, but I'll give a quick snapshot for those who haven't. So we are a charity. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years and we have a vision for a world free of high risk roads. We have a star rating system and road models that, that provide uh, proactive ways to manage safety across road networks. Um, so our, our star rating system, you can see a map of Portugal here, um, Black is for one star, so they're dangerous sections of roads. We go right up to green, which are five star, which are the safest roads. And we do that for the four, like four different road user types. So it's pedestrians, it's bicyclists, it's motorcyclists, and it's vehicle occupants. And so it's a really, um, it's a very good approach to make sure that when a road is being designed or when a road is being built or, or whatever stage it is, those that are doing that are also made conscious of the needs of other road user types and, and aren't tempted to just ignore the fact that pedestrians might be using this road as well and the road actually needs to be safe for them as well. So IRAP's tools, our crash risk mapping, our star rating systems and our, our fatality and serious injury estimation tools have now been used in over 100 countries around the world and we've assessed over a million kilometres of roads and this has informed over $75 billion worth of investment to date. We've got partners all around the world. Um, and we've also informed many of the, the um, road safety targets, including the second decade of action, which, which um, aims to reduce fatalities and serious injuries by half, and the UN road safety targets, which require that all new roads are three star or better by 2030, as well as roads where 75% of travel are happening are three star or better. But the challenge really now is how do we do this on the scale needed to achieve these targets? And that's where our AI RAP initiative comes in. So AI RAP is pretty much about harnessing the, the, the emerging and the existing data that is around um, in order to make road assessments um, and, and road safety much uh, quicker to do, it's cheaper and it's more effective. And so the sorts of data we're looking for is, is um, sort of mapping and navigation data, data from vehicles, crash data, road user data, and so on. The real objective here is to enable access to data. Data often exists in Europe. It's, it's very fortunate that there's quite a bit of data around, but actually putting this into the hands of road authorities and, and enabling that access in order to scale up those, those activities. Um, it's just, there's so many barriers and there's so many challenges. And so it's really about reducing those barriers and challenges. And to do this, we've essentially aiming to do two things. Uh, one is an accreditation scheme, which takes data that might be out there and puts it into a format that uh, is easily used and, and readily, can be readily plugged into either road asset management systems or just for um, road assessments or for other purposes. Um, and then the second element is a data platform. So this is really a, a platform, a, a global platform, if you like, that aims to connect those that have data that they, um, to those that need the data. And doing this has lots of potential. So uh, we get the, the data standardization and the validation, which is really lacking in the, in the data space at the moment. We provide a portal for that exchange of the data, but it also unlocks all of these other um, aspects and, and the potential. So this is where um, star ratings and, and safety assessments can be very routine parts of road asset management systems. It's around being able to scan large road networks, particularly in cities and prioritize those areas that are unsafe and focus in on them. It's informing things like traffic modeling. So we really start to make sure that safety is really embedded in those systems and processes. So this is the IRAP vision. Um, and we're, we're somewhere over on the, the left side of the screen with being able to um, put together single and connected attributes. And th we, we are not doing this ourselves. IRAP is the enabler in this. We are working with organizations right across the world that have this data and are converting it into uh, this, this standard format uh, to enable these things to happen. So once we get single and connected attributes, it, en it enables simple road safety KPIs, uh, we have the data, the data platform, and this starts to enable accessible and large scale um, star ratings 
assessments and risk mapping to happen. As we move along and get groups of critical attributes and then eventually all attributes, it really um, enables those things to then be built into the asset management systems, like I was saying, and starts making um, safety assessments much more routine and, and seamless. Eventually, we are moving towards the, the space where um, star ratings and safety management will be fully integrated in, into um, those systems, and that allows for investment optimization and, and things like application by into, into your insurance systems. And that in itself will also open um, the potential for this social impact investment. And eventually we will move across um, as, as the data availability um, catches up to sort of dynamic real-time star ratings, where this will be informing things like consumer choice about um, people choosing where to walk or where to cycle or where to drive based on, on safety data, not just um, travel times and other, other um, decision points we currently have. Um, and also has a potential of informing vehicle connectivity. So it can be influencing connected and autonomous vehicle um, speeds and driver feedback in real time. So that's the overall picture. The, the two, well, there's a few things to, to note though. This process won't be linear and it won't necessarily uh, be even around the world as well. A lot of this relies on, on the data environments and ecosystems that currently exist. Um, but that's not to say that anything here is, is not possible. In fact, we're doing projects at the moment which all touch on almost every single aspect um, shown here. So the potential is very real and we're working towards it as an organization. And hopefully it will really reduce the reduce the barriers to data and and um, fulfill the potential of it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, really big things are happening uh, with the IRAP scheme and um, uh, congratulate you for that. My uh, question is, as we are moving towards this dynamic real time stars rating, does this mean that hopefully in the future some static thresholds of today. For example, the upper speed limit of a highway, which is only irrelevant and, and it's a static uh, stopper for some uh, stars. Would this maybe be replaced by a more dynamic and safety related data, more integrated than just, okay, if this, if this is your speed limit, something would happen. Do you, do you foresee that? Absolutely. I think the, the can um, the connection through to intelligent transport management systems is, is a very clear one. I think already some of those systems are being able to be adjusted based on road, um, road conditions and, and even weather conditions at the time. Uh, but I think being able to understand that in terms of a star rating, it's very clear when certain conditions change, uh, when speeds increase, that that star rating will change um, because our, our models are incredibly sensitive to, to traffic speeds. And that's where you really want to be um, being able to manage these things in real time and having a, a, a good effect of that. Yes. Excellent. That's really good news. And uh, we are all with you. Uh, was, we are also members to try to, to achieve this goal. If there are Great, no other you. specific uh, comments or questions, uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, we could move uh, to the next presentation. And uh, please look uh, at what uh, IRAP is doing excellent work. We move to Rick Newtons, uh, the Senior Manager of Regulatory Affairs for the EMEA region. Uh, she's working with the 3M Transportation Safety Division. Uh, she's going to present us today critical issues in researching sustainable mobility, others, and infrastructure synergy. Basically, this is uh, ISAT related issues. Uh, yes, Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angelos. I see that the uh, host has uh, blocked my camera. So I. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why, Rick. I think. Yeah, somebody doesn't like yeah. me. Yes, okay, we, thank yes, you. We can see you. Thank you. Uh, I have the clock in front of me and it's just 12 o'clock. So I have to, I have, I know exactly what my 10 minutes are going to be. Uh, let me share my presentation. Uh, I was, I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we can.
Okay, do yes. Um, so yeah, I was glad to see already several presentations on uh, physical infrastructure and how technology is uh, is helping to uh, assess the quality of um, of road infrastructure. And my presentation will also move a little bit into that to see the relationship between uh, physical road infrastructure and driver assistance, which is a hot topic at the European Commission today. Um, introducing 3M is not always easy. So this slide, I think you can see it at the presentation. Our president, Dan Chen, already elaborated on it as well. Uh, we are uh, um, a big company relying a lot on innovation and trying to bring new products on the market every day. Um, future of mobility, uh, I think it was mentioned already several times. Uh, intelligent cars will help us to see things uh, pretty soon and already today also they will uh, bring additional hands and then uh, talking about artificial intelligence and decision making uh, they will bring an additional brain uh, to our service as well. So uh, pretty soon, and I think this is the objective of many companies as well, is that we can then, as a passenger, we can use our brain for uh, something else beside driving. But we're not there yet. Um, the, um, the relationship, uh, driver assistance and uh, infrastructure, has been mentioned already a couple of times and uh, more and more studies are also showing uh, the, the importance uh, of road markings, traffic signs uh, in relationship to these uh, driver assistance. The, um, the European Commission has put it in their uh, big objectives on European on the move, Europe on the move, and this third mobility package in Europe, which will uh, is there to come because I think next year the first we will see the first impl implementations already. The general uh, safety regulation will make uh, lane keeping systems, uh, intelligent speed adaptation, adaptive cruise control, uh, a whole range of uh, driver assistance will become mandatory in the next generations of vehicles. And by 2024, uh, we will see uh, that every vehicle will have to have it. Studies have shown um, that there is a good relationship uh, between good road quality and uh, these driver assistance. So the objective to, to reduce accidents and, re and save lives is possible. Uh, of course, the debate on who, what roles and responsibilities is another dis discussion, which is sometimes frustrating. Uh, what is the role of the authority what is the role of the uh, autom um, the driving the car company, and uh, and of course the driver for the moment is still in control. Uh, from 3M, we have tried to bring a little piece to the puzzle, a little solution, uh, as more and more studies also indicate that uh, driver assistance, uh, don't, uh, road markings, and rain don't match together. So. Uh, the glass beads, which make road markings visible uh, when they get wet, uh, they are uh, no longer able to return the light. So there is technology there that will help uh, to make these road markings visible when it rains. So you just blend in other refractive index beads that compensate for the, this, um, the confusion or let's say the light uh, the direction of the light that is disturbed by the water layer. <clears throat> the test that I wanted to share in the next minutes is one of the challenges that you have as a, as a company in, in innovation is that you can't go on the road immediately with, uh, with new technology. So you are either limited to the laboratory or you have to downscale the, the tests uh, in order to validate the material that you have. Uh, we did not exactly want to uh, look at the impact on driver assistance. We just wanted to see how uh, different types of beads and different types of road markings could influence the picture, the, the clarity of the picture that then would be analyzed by the algorithm 
uh, in the drive in the other system. So we work together with Fedecom, uh, which is a um, renowned institute in France and based in Versailles. So they uh, looked at several markings uh, that had the whole range of performance from being visible uh, with having the beads that should be visible during the rain and all the way to a black marking that is used uh, to cover existing markets in work zones so to make sure that these markings are not visible. So we wanted to make sure that these markings, uh, that also this black marking did not create any false uh, positives. So the study was really done to identify these markings clearly by the vehicle and even uh, technology was used, which is not available in the car today to make sure that the sensor would not be confused and, and really look at the marking itself. Here, the picture on the right, you can see that with all the data fusion uh, that uh, the uh, marking was, if visible, was really uh, part of the picture. So we looked at uh, the contrast, uh, or Vericom looked at the contrast from the, uh, the luminance of the marking compared to the luminance of the road surface uh, beside the markings. So uh, here we used only asphalt. So if this, the measurements would have been done on concrete, uh, the contrast ratings would, or the contrast would have been totally different. Uh, we also looked at visible, uh, how it, compared to the human eye. And you could see that during the day, also here, the brightness of the marking plays a big role. A yellow is a little bit more difficult to see. And also if the sun is in, in a glaring uh, position that uh, sometimes you get totally the opposite uh, effect that some markings which would not be visible suddenly become visible as well, just because of the mirror effect of the, the sunlight. Um, during the night, uh, and rain here, again, we saw differences. Here, the reflectivity plays a big role. And of course, when the marking gets wet, uh, some of them disappeared. And in some cases, uh, we also observed, this was not planned, but this was a, a benefit that is road furniture, which is often used in construction work zones. The, reflect the reflection of this road furniture could be very disturbing and make the road markings even more difficult to see, uh, also to the human eye, but also then uh, to the camera. The way we collect the data is, of course, you compare human vision to machine vision. And here, a camera is looking at pixels and is then looking at the brightness and the color of these, of these pixels. And then the algorithm has to uh, be able to decipher uh, the object, is it uh, road marking or is it not? The, the way we collected the data, as you can see, we measured contrast, but then the column to the right is also showing the confidence. How much data points did we collect? Did we get 100% of the data points that we wanted to collect? And in some cases, you could see that the visibility of the road marking or the weather situation would not allow us to, to collect a lot of data. And this is also quite important. Uh, some of the data, the contrast it was quite easy to collect, but in some cases uh, we collected or the sensor obtained much less data than we expected. That means that also the sensor uh, was not able to uh, collect all the data. So here you can see that the weather had really an impact on some of the, or the rain really had an impact on the, um, on the, on the collection of the data. And uh, some markings were only visible, let's say 20% uh, of the time uh, where other markings would be visible 90% uh, of the time. The overall conclusion is that uh, during the day, you could see that the whiteness plays a big role and the, mark, the marking that did not have any beads was of course the most white. And you could see a slight benefit of having most of the white pigments at the surface, not covered by beads. And even the camera picked up this slight difference and gave it a slightly better contrast rating. But it's, the overall conclusion is really that it's very difficult to get a high contrast in daytime. Uh, you see the bigger conferences at night 
when then suddenly you have a very dark background and the contrast is much easier to measure. And also here you can see that some of the markings had difficulties to be visible uh, in wet or in rain conditions. Only the markings that had the, um, the special beads uh, provided enough contrast to be picked up by the sensor. Another thing to mention is that as we measured only 15 meters in front of the vehicle, uh, there is also an impact by diffuse illumination by the, by the headlamps. The further you look in the, in the distance, the more the impact is really um, defined by the beats and the ability of the beats to return the light uh, back to the vehicle. We also looked at LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR showed a very similar profile as uh, light itself. Uh, road markings that are very good for visible light also seem to be very good for uh, LIDAR. The only difference with LIDAR is that you, um, the LIDAR sends out its own near infrared light. So the sunlight doesn't make any difference. Uh, you always have type of nighttime conditions uh, in a lighter environment. Uh, there is no difference uh, between day and night for a lighter. It's, it always depends on the light that the lighter sensor is sending out. So overall, we can make a conclusion that uh, for daytime, the visibility of the road marking is very important. It's really the, uh, the standard 1436 is capable of helping the authorities in defining this daytime brightness. Also the norm, the European norm 1436 is capable of helping to specify road markings that are visible both to LiDAR and both to uh, the traditional video cameras. Uh, and of course, if you look at the wet reflective properties, also here the, no the European norm uh, with the RR properties and the way to test it is really available to, um, to make sure that, the that you can specify road markings that have the capability to be visible during the, uh, during the night at rain. You just, um, so the specifications can be put. Of course, the relationship to the uh, background is very important. So I, the more details of the studies are available. I just did not want to go too deep in the study today. Thank you, Angelo, back to you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, excellent presentation and indeed uh, a very good benchmarking. Um, we can see what we have to do and to solve uh, versus automated driving in the future from the infrastructure side. And um, I think um, also uh, you pointed out which sensor where and how we could or we should fuse those. There is one question for you. Uh, so I will read it out uh, from the audience. Have you tried to check the reflexivity index of the markings when there are road studs? If so, what was the result? No, we did not use road studs. Uh, the information I have about the road studs is that the surface is really too small uh, to be picked up by, uh, by sensors. So you really need a bigger line and surface uh, for the sensor to, in order to uh, figure out a picture. Sensors, are, these reflectors are very good for uh, for a uh, human, but not so much for, uh, for, uh, for machine vision. Very good. Thank you very much, Rick, uh, for again, once more for the excellent and detailed presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we move to the last presentation by Nikolaus Stildorf. Um, Nikolaus is a global business developer manager at Smarco, uh, and he's going to talk to us about moving from silos to digital smart mobility. Uh, Perfect. And Thank you very much. Nicholas. Oh, sorry oh, for interrupting. Yes, <laughs> Go no ahead. problem. Go ahead. Yours. Perfect. So you should all, in theory at least, see my screen right now. Um, now we do. Now we do. Perfect. Here we are. All righty. So thank you very much, and 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 to, uh, that I can wrap up the session today with moving from silos to digital and smart mobility. Um, what I try to make sure when we now talk about uh, this topic is that it's much less any any sort of product uh, presentation, but much more an insight into what we learned from our market. So what we saw, and then I'll quickly give you guys an outline, um, our customer needs are drastically changing, specifically in the world of, of mobility management and Swarco, as well as, as the remaining industry obviously is here to, to provide solutions to that. So how do I make those statements? 
we as Varco, together with all of our partners, have initiated last year a a global process of really interviewing. And right now, we are I just took a screenshot a few days ago of over 450 inter, um, let's say critical stakeholders, which really means largely cities, which means, for example, consultants, planners, which means partners, to overall get an idea of which direction is our, our world moving in the world of mobility. Um, and that, to me, the most, most important question here was, in order to make sure that we provide real solutions to problems, what are your top five problem statements? And uh, there we spent quite some time in trying to analyze that data and into into consolidating the data and making it analyzable. And so today, in today's session, I picked out six of the top uh, or the six top problem statements that we saw globally uh, from a city perspective that we need to challenge to move into the next world of a smart and digital uh, world of mobility, and then give you guys an idea how we believe as Swark and how our industry overall believes that we can provide answers to these problem statements. Um, as before, also, please feel free to shoot your questions in, in the chat, and we'll then handle them right after. So the first one that came up, um, and that obviously we've heard now a couple of times today, that the, the topic around smart mobility, connected mobility, smart city, um, but overall in, in most of the cities that you look at today, if you look at their vision statement and you ask them overall where you want to get today, say, we want to find ways how to get into a world of, of a smart city, of becoming a smarter city, a more connected city. And um, when we then dig deeper and say, what, if that's the problem, if that's the vision, what's really your problem? Then the main answer we received was this. They said, we have this massive patchwork of, of, of subsystems uh, that are all partially connected, maybe not connected, but really our infrastructure, we now have 10, 12, 15 different independent systems running and we're anything but smart or connected. So what is that really? Or when we now take a step further, analyzing that. So today's most cities operate a patchwork of independent systems which largely act in an isolated manner. We all know that. We all know that a traffic management system might actually be independent of an adaptive system, might actually be independent of a parking guidance system, of a journey time system, and so on. You name all these different aspects aspects that we see in mobility, a lot of times these are completely siloed subsystems. A lot, first of all, due to the lack of standards, but also because simply those were all procured in maybe different, different operations or different projects, but different departments. A, so what, but what do we obviously need? A paradigm shift towards holistic mobility management is urgently needed. So if I not only want to make sure that I have different siloed systems to tackle the world of, let's say, vehicle traffic, but I really want to talk about smart mobility overall with multi-mobility, with different models to use for my last and first mile, with integrating public transport and new modes of transportation, I obviously need to move away from, from such a setup. So therefore... Um, we see a critical need, and cities brought it up to us, to really work towards mobility management platforms. And how we tackle that on uh, Swarco, we have a, a platform that we now worked over four years in, found own companies for all of that, is a, a on our end, a mobility management platform called MyCity. And in MyCity, we have all these different subsystems. We brought them together on a single platform where a customer can choose, I want, only want to use this solution or that solution or bring them all together. But not only can you bring them all together on a platform, as you see on the right side, but also you have in the middle a, a let's say, um, a strategy manager, a machine that allows you to create certain if-then rules where you can uh, roll out different use cases by connecting all these different subsystems. All right, let's get to the next one. Then when we talk to cities again, um, problem statement, another one was by having this patchwork, we also have this patchwork from a hardware software perspective. So this complex third-party management, we really don't know how to handle any more the markets. We have 10 different vendors out there or 100 different vendors in terms of hardware. They all have different interfaces, different integrations. We as a city cannot really operate that anymore. We constantly something breaks because somebody shoots at an update in that sense. But if we now go back to that big vision of a smart, digital, and connected mobility world, any definition that we look up for smart and connected city, you see the common denominator in them is the capability to share and process data from different systems in an urban environment. So therefore, this, this problem statement is a critical one and actually a blocker to realize their vision. So therefore, we, we then, when we, when we dug a little deeper and said, but what does that really mean? What are the pain points or what could 
uh, companies provide? What could what could be the solutions that allow you to go a step further? And then we really saw it's two aspects. It's on the one hand that we now use the, the umbrella term, the technical interface management. So the shortage of skilled resources is stated as one of the top city problem statements. And I'm sure that most cities that are participating today can feel the exact same way that they say, I have a few guys that are experts in IT and in, in traffic and in mobility, but it's never, it's, it's far not enough to handle all these challenges that we have. Therefore, we really have to pick and choose. And when you talk about technical interface management, that really means highly skilled people that know how to work with all these APIs to maintain that stuff. Um, so therefore, we see that shortage, how cities are able to, or if, if cities are able to do that. Um, then cities understand that their knowledge and capacity can never satisfy the complex operations behind technically maintaining such tremendous amounts of interfaces. So if they're already challenged today, if we really want to move into, a, a, again, a buzzword, but into a smart city environment where we share, share and process data from all ends, maybe not even only from the mobility environment, but also across the mobility environment, this is something critical to be handled. So therefore, again, coming back to that aspect of mobility management platforms, cities start to choose, and we see that that traction, um, choose to outsource the technical interface management and focus on strategic topics. Meaning they say, rather than me procuring all these different subsystems and silos, and then me needing to manage all these integrations and making sure it works, I want a platform where also the vendor behind it makes sure that all these subsystems, so hardware components, sensors, integrations with other central systems are handled and maintained by that platform provider. And I have a single point of contact or in a negative way, a single throw to choke for, uh, to tackle exactly this challenge. So that's the technical interface management. And then on the other hand, which was actually surprising to us, um, or at least we didn't have it on the radar big enough, but it, it now becomes more and more logical, is the topic of contractual interface management. So what do we mean with that? Digitalization has led to a heterogeneous field of business models. So let's all think of, of ourselves. We might pay X amount of euros or dollars or whatever per month for our video streaming service. There might be another application that I, that I paid for in a one-off procurement, maybe some piece of hardware, maybe my office chair. There might be another one that says, every time you ping my API, I want X amount of cents, or I get charged by my, my, my cell provider X amount of euros per gigabyte that I use it. So all of these are different business models that cities are really struggling with um, to, to work with that heterogeneous setup. So public procurement regulations are largely focused on a traditional CapEx model. So largely focused on, I now have this grant, I now have this in my budget, I now need to one time purchase that, but they really struggle with reoccurring and transactional pricing models. And more than anything, they struggle with that heterogeneous setup. So having 10 different business models that a city needs to be able to consume is a challenge for them. So cities will require coming back to, to mobility mat management platforms, but overall to larger scale providers that serve as the, and I'm now using the term contractual aggregator, that integrate the variety of business models into a single contractual stream that cities can procure. So also maybe a challenge to us technology providers, even if we build a solution that technically, or something that technically becomes a solution to a problem that, is, that cities are facing, if they cannot consume it, we still don't allow them to enjoy that benefit or that value add, and therefore give that value add to the citizens of that city. So therefore we really saw, um, we need to work that better out. We need to, to really double down on our efforts also to make sure that we can provide and make sure a city can consume all of that by having a single contractual agreement with us. And we then work in all these different heterogeneous setups of, of, of business models with the subsystems to make sure they, they can really arrive at the city. Then another point, forefront of innovation over rigid customization. So I think probably one out of 10 cities that we talk to, they told us one of our main problem statements are, are rapid innovations that we really not, our processes also, that we're really not able to handle. So what we mean with that is, or what they meant with that in examples was, for example, mobility as a service started happening. They already thought that was fast and they didn't really know how to, how to work with that. But then once e-scooters hit the road, they really said, we have no clue what, what to do. We spent millions to keep in our downtown nice and safe um, or safe, nice and, and beautiful, friendly for tourism. And now all our pedestrian walks are, are, are littered 
with all these different modalities. We need some. We need to become quicker. We need to become faster. But obviously, the the procurement cycles and the, the management cycles in in the public environment are slower, with with reason, because um, obviously it's tax money. So. Adoption rates in our industry are lagging behind and therefore fail to benefit from innovations and the stat phase disruptions. So when we take I don't know, as an example how fast cloud gets adopted in a government environment rather than in a or in compared to B2B or a private consumer environment, obviously you see a massive latency on that end. Um, but that obviously also means that a lot of these value adds that could be provided with such technologies all of a sudden become disruptors to then to, to big benefits. Then the exponential acceleration of innovation in mobility space will further amplify such discrepancy. So there's very few, and I've been until September, I was in, in, in California for five years, now in Berlin. And you, you see there, when you go to Silicon Valley, there's very few industries where so much venture capital flows in, and there's so much interest also from a private equity side of things, than mobility. So the more also there's boost from that end, the faster innovation and disruption will get. So this problem that we're just describing will just get more amplified. Nico, sorry, could yep. you please conclude? Because we are- Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'll hurry here. So since cities, yada, 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 uh, emerging innovations, um, maybe, maybe as a last point for two minutes, um, was a secure hosting over expensive in-house infrastructure. So what we learned from these cities is they have no clue how to handle all these, these cybersecurity threats. So here you see a statistic of, of the damage that has been done or the, the in, in, in millions actually, so amount of monetary damage cost. And we see that cities are not able to handle that. So also this is a portion where we see a big needs for cities or, or big, big, yeah, big need on that end that they start thinking, how can I outsource the portion of, of um, yeah, handling my a safe IT infrastructure rather than doing that whole thing in-house. All righty, I would say that that was it. I'll wrap it up from, from my end so that we don't break the time here. And, Thank you very uh, much. Back uh, to the questions. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, you presented us the big opportunity, smart city as a service in reality. And you presented us uh, the My City tool, which I think is very promising. And uh, certainly we are going to look uh, further on it. And I presume many of our colleagues here in the interest of time, we don't make a question, uh, but clearly we ask everybody and there are several comments on the chat to come back to you directly. Perfect. With that, uh, I think we managed to close the session practically on time, although we started with a quarter of delay. And I think um, uh, here, Susanna, I did a good job without rushing. And it is my honor and my pleasure to leave uh, the floor to my good friend and fellow countryman, the president of IRF, Bill Halkas, to wrap up the day and close. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, everybody. i like to thank from the bottom of my heart all the presenters, the moderators, for the excellent work that has been done. Of course, i like to thank uh, Susanna, Susanna Zamataro, Meline Hugh, uh, Agostina, and uh, Gonzalo, uh, all the staff uh, in Geneva for doing uh, this excellent work. Also our colleagues in China, uh, Nina and uh, Dr. Liu, uh, having uh, them linked in from, uh, from China and offering the translation uh, was a very, very good uh, idea. Uh, now, tomorrow we will link a 9.20 uh, Geneva time to wrap up the first session. And you don't need another link uh, to link, uh, to come into, uh, into the tomorrow's meeting. Uh, it's the same, the same link. Uh, I've been following the, the attendance. Uh, we had up to 300 people at, uh, sometimes, but the most important thing was uh, following the chat, seeing people from Nepal, from China, from Pakistan, uh, from Africa, from Latin America, from the US, of course, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from Europe. So this was really a, a true global event, and that makes us all of us uh, happy. And obviously the uh, sessions uh, were recorded and they will be posted on our website uh, in due time. So again, many, many thanks. I uh, thank you again uh, and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, goodbye everyone.